It wasn't that I'd suddenly become converted to a belief in nuclear airplanes. It was rather this was the only avenue open for ORNL for continuing in reactor development. That the purpose was unattainable, if not foolish, was not so important. <laughs> a high temperature reactor could be useful for other purposes, even if it never propelled an airplane. He knew that to make the nuclear airplane work, they couldn't use water-cooled reactors. They couldn't use high-pressure reactors. They couldn't use complicated solid fuel reactors. They had to have something that was so slick, that was so safe, that was so simple, that operated at low pressure, high temperatures, had all the features you wanted in it. They didn't even know what it was. I think someday this will be looked at as one of the great pivot points of history, that if this program, this nuclear airplane program, had not been established, the molten salt reactor would have never been invented because it is simply too radical, too different, too completely out of the ball field of everything else for it to be arrived at through an evolutionary development. It had to be forced into existence by requirements that were so difficult to achieve, and the nuclear airplane was that. Everybody who was pushing thorium said, we like thermal, this is the kind of reactor we want to build. And everybody who was pushing plutonium said, no, 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 we want a fast reactor. That's the only way to do it. They, by and large, said, we're going to go the plutonium route. And one of the reasons why was they had developed a great deal of understanding about plutonium from the weapons program. They had made the stuff. They had worked with its chemistry. They'd made fuel out of it. They go, we get this. Thorium, we haven't really messed with thorium. You know, it would be like starting over. What the biggest problem is now is the technical development. We had a corpus of people in Oak Ridge who knew how to do this in the mid-1970s. They're literally dead and gone now. You know, I've met a handful of them. They're in their 80s. You know, they're not going to do this anymore. The first and hardest thing I think we need to do is to get this knowledge in the nuclear community. I've been in a nuclear engineering program for years now, and you don't get taught this stuff in nuclear engineering school. I got an email a few weeks ago. Once you know, I just graduated from Purdue with my PhD in nuclear engineering. I have never heard of this stuff before. And he goes, I want to tell you, it's even worse than that because I'm totally a student of nuclear history and I've never heard of this. How did I not hear this? A thousand kilograms of U-233, which is roughly what we've got. You know, 90% of that will fission. We can make about five, six hundred million dollars in the electricity. Another 50 or 60 million dollars on the fission of the uranium-235. Out of about 1,000 kilograms, about 15 kilograms of plutonium-238 will be left over. Now, this is good stuff. NASA is desperate for this stuff. This is Plutonium-238 is different than plutonium-239, the stuff we use in bombs. This is the stuff NASA uses in its deep space batteries. Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, New Horizons, all these deep space probes. We're completely out of the stuff. We stopped making it years ago. The Russians stopped making it years ago. We are out. If we don't get some, we're done exploring the outer solar system. This machine would actually make it in course of normal operation. In addition, it would make medical molybdenum-99. This is used in hundreds of thousands of uh, radio imaging procedures every year. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It would make five grams of that thorium-229 we could use in targeted alpha therapy. We don't even know how much that's worth. 20 kilograms of radiostronium that we could use in radioisotope heating sources. Uh, this is the cheap stuff. It'll make xenon and neodymium. Almost everything that comes out of this reactor can be sold. You're looking at like a billion dollars. There's such a thing as nuclear hacking. It's what this whole thing is about. Because we're not talking about nuclear technology the way it's done now. We're talking about a completely different approach to nuclear energy than everything we're doing now and all kinds of improvements. I mean, where did our world of personal computers and all this stuff come from? Did it come from the IBM mainframes? No, it came from dudes having homebrew computer clubs in 1975. We'll look back in the future and it's meetings and gatherings like this and go, man, that was where it got started. It didn't get started at Westinghouse or Atomic Energy of Canada or GE. None of those guys are going to go build these machines because they're already locked into the solid uranium fuel stuff. They're locked into doing it the way we do it now. And you know what? The way we do it now, it's a really inefficient way to burn stuff because you can't let the fuel get very damaged before you have to take it out. You can't even come, you can't even come close to 100% burn. I mean, not even approaching it. I don't have a lot of faith that the current nuclear industry is going to take it on. And to be honest, what exactly do we want from them? I mean, all of their technology is based around technology that isn't what's going to go into this machine. All their money now is coming off fuel supply contracts. That's how GE and Westinghouse make money on nuclear power today. They don't build reactors, they sell fuel. Hey, guess what? I got a reactor. It's got no fuel fabrication to it. You've just upended their business model.
kid, my, my dad said I like trains until he took me to see Star Wars. And I actually remember seeing Star Wars. I know what day Star Wars came out. I know what day I was born. I was two years and ten months old when I saw Star Wars. And it's my earliest memory. And my dad didn't believe that I actually remembered that until I started actually relating details from the day it happened. And he said, after all I talked about was space. I was really into space, drew space shuttles and everything in there. Dreamt of working at NASA. Ended up, did work at NASA for 10 years. My name is Kirk Sorensen, everybody. I didn't, I didn't even introduce myself. Hi. 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 Don't worry about anything. Uh, I'm, I live in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a recovering aerospace engineer, working on becoming a newly minted uh, nuclear engineer. You know what I've noticed? Everybody who's kind of techy just seems to be into energy. You know, it's like you can't avoid getting the kick out of energy. All my NASA buddies were all totally into energy. You know, they'd always want to talk about, let's talk about the energy crisis. I'm like, yeah, we should talk about this rocket. But yeah, you're right, let's talk about the energy crisis. You know, because the thing that caught my eye when I was still in high school was the idea of uh, space solar power satellites. I heard about this a long time ago. And I started reading all these books, and, and the, the gist was Gerard O'Neill back in the 70s. Raise your hand if you've read The High Frontier. Right back there, all right. So Gerard O'Neill had a very utopian vision of the future, and I give him full marks for that because we need more people having utopian visions of the future. It's easy to have a dystopian vision of the future. It's kind of hard to have a utopian vision of the future. Well, his idea was we were going to go build these space colonies in space. And it was going to be great. It was going to be like living in a shopping mall in space, you know. And, and you know, have a little home in the tube. And, uh, and you said, well, how are you going to pay for this? And the idea was you were going to build these really, really big solar power satellites. These are like a mile across, 10 miles long. So like a Star Destroyer would be small next to one of these things. And this is what the people in the space colony were going to do to pay the bills back home to get Earthlings to keep sending them I don't know, iPods or whatever it was they were going to want that they couldn't make in their space colony. And it seemed like a great idea because, well, we all knew we needed energy, and solar energy sure seemed great. One of the problems with solar energy is we live on a planet that rotates. Half the day, you don't get the solar energy. Well, up in space, it's always sunny. You build these things, and they're going to shoot the energy back. I mean, this, like, really affected the way I thought. So I want to do this. I want to go make this happen. And uh, so I went to engineering school at Utah State University. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and I... I learned all about the important things mechanical engineers learn about, like thermodynamics. And you begin to realize, oh my goodness, you know, nature's actually put certain constraints on what you want to do. You can't just, you know, convert 100% of heat to electricity. That doesn't work. Uh, Mr. Carnot has something to say about that. If you heard of Carnot, raise your hand. Okay, all right, cool. A few Mechies back here. All right, so this sometimes disappoints people when you tell them what Carnot figured out, which is that you can't turn all heat into electricity or into work. You only get part of it. But the thing I really got lit up about when I was in college was this program, the X-33, being built by the Skunk Works in California, which is just a cool name. I mean, who doesn't want to work at the Skunk Works? Plus, I read the book Skunk Works, and then I was like, okay, I definitely have to work here. And finally, hook and crook, I managed to get a, a summer internship there in 1997. I'm really glad I did that because every good thing in my life actually came out of getting on this program. And I thought, well, we're going to build this rocket, and this rocket is going to be fully reusable. It's going to go up in space, and it's going to reduce the cost of getting to space just by a ton. And that would make it possible to build all that other cool stuff we saw in here, you know, the, the space colonies and the mall in the sky and the big solar power satellites and living on the moon. And I was like, this is the important first step. Well, I got in the program, and I found out pretty quick um, there was a reason why all the engineers were real glum about it. It was not going well. Again, we were bumping up against these pesky laws of physics. You know, you can dictate all you want with money and, and uh, management, but, you know, physics will be satisfied. So the X-33 did not succeed. Now, it's not my fault. I mean, it's really not my fault, you know. <laughs> I really tried hard, but it just didn't work out. On my way out to California to go work at the Skunk Works, I went in a, in a, in a bookstore and I bought this book called The Millennial Project. Now, look at this book. Colonizing the Galaxy in Eight Easy Steps. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's like crack for an engineer, you know? <laughs> I mean, I felt the same way about this book that I felt about reading O'Neill's book, The High Frontier. I mean, it was extremely utopian, but a little different. This guy, Marshall Savage, starts out his first step in his big plan, and it was a big plan. I mean, I got to give him full marks for this. But he said, we need to build these floating ocean colonies, and we should learn how to live on the open ocean as a preparatory step to learning how to live in space. And I still think he's absolutely right about that. I don't think we're ready to live in space yet. We have not learned how to live in a way where we recycle 
much more of our, I mean, if you want to live in space, you got to recycle everything. This is a lot easier because you still got the atmosphere to go recycle your air and everything, but you're, you're taking a major step towards being prepared to colonize space. Well, what Savage proposed to power his floating ocean colony, an ocean thermal electric converter, or OTEC. Anytime you have something that's hot and something that's cold, you can drive an engine between those two things. I mean, they're just the very first principles. OTEC is based on the idea that the water at the surface is warm and the water down deep is cold. The water down deep is very close to freezing and the water at the surface might be, you know, 80, even 90 degrees. And between those two reservoirs of liquid, you can actually make work or electricity. Now, it's very, very low efficiency. I mean, ideal efficiency for this would be like 4%. Realistic efficiency, probably one and a half to two percent. I mean, extremely, extremely inefficient, but you have unlimited amounts of cold and you have theoretically unlimited amounts of hot. So between that, he says, well, this would be great. Another really cool thing about it is you bring this cold water up and it spawns all kinds of growth in, in, in plant life and animal life. And it's really healthy for the ocean to, to bring this cold, deep water. Because I guess that's where all the nutrients sink. The problem with OTEC is it is very geographically constrained. There's not a lot of places in the world you can do it. The ocean is cold everywhere, but it's only hot in some places. This was a map of this sweet spot of where you'd want to make this work. We don't live really anywhere near this, this sort of uh, orange bubble here now, do we? In fact, there's almost, there's almost nobody lives where the orange bubble is. I thought, well, heck, maybe we can make the hot side a little hotter by employing some solar concentrators and juice up this process. Then I had an opportunity after working at the Skunk Works to go to Georgia Tech. And they let me to go to Georgia Tech, not because I had good grades or anything, I really didn't, but my professor found out I've been on the X-33 and he said, oh, hot dang, you know, come to Georgia Tech and, and work in our group. I said, well, what are you working on? He goes, we're working on space solar power. And I said, oh, <laughs> oh boy, you know, I was, I you had me at space solar power, you know, so I, so off I went to Georgia Tech. We were getting paid by a guy named John Mankins at NASA headquarters to look at space solar power. And he was kind of rebooting the idea, taking it out of the 70s. We weren't so much looking at the, you know, the space colony, the shopping mall in space approach anymore. We were looking at, okay, we're going to haul the pieces up ourselves. We were trying to figure out rockets that were way better than the X-33. And I was scratching my head a little bit because I was like, well, you know, guys, I just came off this program and we were like having a really hard time getting it to work and now you want to like do it a thousand times better than that you know I'm a I'm a skit skeptical one of the things that we were always trying to figure out was how cheap did we have to make the rocket to get all these space solar power parts up in space so I had this buddy and he had this big spreadsheet model and it was all about the whole cost model building the giant solar power satellites and beaming them down to the earth and distributing the power everywhere and we made all kinds of great assumptions in this model like we said okay we're going to have like you know 75 percent efficient solar arrays and we're going to have microwave generators that are going to transform this solar energy into microwave energy absolutely perfectly and down here on the ground we're going to have this rectifying microwave array that will turn the microwave energy back into electrical energy and it's going to be really really efficient and the land that this thing covers up like 10 kilometers we're just going to assume that's free you know and we're going to assume that the Earth is so messed up at this point that power is like obscenely expensive. So we had this really like road warrior future vision of like all the oil was gone and the planet was desperate and it was like, all right, what are we going to do? And, and every kilowatt hour cost like a dollar. And I mean, it was a, let me just say, it was like a very favorable situation. So into, the, so into this model, we were putting our rockets and and really for the rockets our goal was to 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 make this as good as possible so the rocket could be ever more expensive because it was a lot easier to build an expensive rocket than it is to build a cheap rocket this whole model came down to how many dollars per pound can we charge to put this dude in space and still make money and my buddy kept nursing this number down you know he was always trying to he goes no nah, no nah, you can't do four hundred dollars a kilogram okay can we do two hundred dollars a kilogram oh, yeah. I said well how low do we have to go well, I'll never forget this one day. I was sitting there with a the computer with him, and I said, dude, just punch in zero. Punch in zero dollars a kilogram, okay? Because as an engineer, you want to bound the space. You, know, you want to figure out, okay, if this is not good enough, and this is zero, ideally there is an answer betwixt this number and zero. So if we go to zero and zero looks good, then we can back off a of zero, and we can kind of start maneuvering our way to finding out what that magic number needs to be. I assume zero would look good. 
So he punches zero. I never do. He punches zero in the model. Guess what? Zero didn't work. <laughs> zero didn't work. I said zero means that we can like snap our fingers and this stuff is not on the ground. It's in space and it's put together. The best case scenario. It doesn't get any better than that. So if you're telling me that zero doesn't work and we've got this future world, you know, water world where, you know, we burned all the oil and we're desperate. Why are we still messing with this if zero doesn't work? And he's like, our professor told us to, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and I just, at that moment, I was just like, oh boy, I just, it's like I just lost my faith. My professor found out about it and he did not want us to pass this little tidbit of information on to the guy who was funding the program. You know, under the understanding, the guy who's funding the program will probably stop funding the program as soon as you tell him that zero doesn't work because your whole thesis is toast. Okay, so I don't know if that ever quite got communicated to this guy. Well, I graduated from Georgia Tech not long thereafter, and I thought, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not getting a PhD. I'm not hanging around this place very much long. I'm going to get a real job. I'm going to get married. I'm going to make some money. I met a girl when I was at Georgia Tech, you know, and she was, she was interested in me, which was also kind of amazing. And... Um, <laughs> She was from Atlanta, so, you know, I really liked her and wanted to marry her, and she made it pretty clear that we did not need to go too terribly far away from Atlanta as we pursued future, you know, life, happiness, children, home, all that good stuff. I was from Utah originally, so, uh, you know, I was kind of heading more out west, and uh, so I said, well, hey, how about Huntsville, Alabama? That's not too far, right? You know, she said, oh, yeah, that's acceptable, four-hour drive from Atlanta, you know, draw the radius around Atlanta, that, that works. So I ended up uh, getting a job at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center at NASA. My first job was working in a group that did these really kind of futuristic, far out things. We were looking at nuclear rockets. Now this time, I was not particularly excited about nuclear. You know, I thought, nuclear, eh, isn't that kind of bad or dirty or yucky? Or, and I just had this sort of vague distaste for nuclear. And we were working on nuclear engines. We were working on really far out stuff. Well, one day, I'm uh, in this buddy of mine's office. He got a book on his shelf. And the book was called Fluid Fuel Reactor. Fluid Fuel Reactor? What the heck is that? I had no idea. Never heard of it. And he said, oh, yeah. He used to work at Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee. And he said, yeah, yeah, way back when, they were doing some stuff on this at Oak Ridge. He goes, I just went to the library, and I got this old book. It was written in 1958. And uh, he said, yeah, I've been meaning to look through it. I, I kind of knew a little bit about it, but not very much. Go ahead and borrow. So I took the book home, big old thick book. It was like a thousand pages. Uh, I started trying to read it. I like, had no idea what the book was talking about. I was just struggling really hard to uh, try to grasp the nuclear concepts in the book. But it was intriguing enough to me, and it seemed really different than the kind of nuclear energy we had now. And they also mentioned in this book a lot about thorium, 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 thorium. I was like... Dude, what the heck is thorium? Okay, it's on the periodic table. It's number 90. It's like two spots away from uranium. That's about all I knew. So we'll take it from first principles. Let's talk a little bit about what nuclear fission is. You have fissile nuclei. That means this is a nucleus that if you hit it with a neutron, it's going to fission and split into two pieces, two fission products. And also significantly, this one neutron is going to spawn the formation of two or three additional neutrons. Why do we care? Well, here, oh, darn. Here's why we care. Because every kilogram of fissile material will produce as much energy as 13,000 barrels of oil. Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than a chemical reaction. Civilization has changed over advancements in technology a whole lot more modest than this. When you fission something, it breaks into these two pieces. But they're radioactive. And I tried to understand why are they radioactive. And this is a chart that shows the number of uh, protons in matter and the number of neutrons. Now, if the number of protons and the number of neutrons were the same, all of these isotopes would stay on this nice line right here, you see? But they don't do that. At the beginning, it's a roughly equal number of protons and neutrons. But as they get heavier, they definitely get on the very neutron-rich side of things. Okay, so you see these black dots. Those are the stable nucleides, and all the other guys are are radioactive. The strong nuclear force is holding the nucleus together and the protons are pushing the nucleus apart. Okay, the protons are all positively charged. They want to rip the thing apart. The neutrons are adding more of that strong nuclear force glue, holding everything together, and they're not adding more of the push it apart stuff. They're not adding more of the repulsive force. So that's why you end up with a lot more neutrons in nuclear matter than in protons. Way, way, way down here are uranium and thorium, and they have about one and a half times as many neutrons as protons. When you bust them in half, 
the two pieces that you get inherit that ratio. But it's the wrong ratio for them. They're over here. They want it to be more like one and a quarter instead of one and a half. They have too many neutrons. They're neutron rich. You can't dump the neutrons. Nature has a nifty process for fixing this little problem. It's called beta decay. And in beta decay, this is kind of a gross oversimplification, but a neutron essentially turns into a proton and it spits out an electron. When you fission a nucleus, why is what you get out radioactive? And it has to do with this proton and neutron balance. The balance is wrong for what you've made, even though it was right for what you started with. This is a code I wrote in Java. You can actually download it from my website, where I map out all of these different possible combinations of fission. And these are the uh, mass numbers of each of those. And they assume two broad peaks of distribution. This is the smaller fission product. And this is the larger fission product. Because each fission generates two of them. Okay? And, uh, and there's certain numbers of masses that are more common in this reaction than others. You know, like mass number 111, you get it sometimes, but not very often. You know, mass number 93, pretty darn common. That one happens quite a bit. Okay, so you get these two parts. But because they're neutron rich, they have to beta decay a couple of times before they reach a stable nucleus. And let me show you another. Here's a little bit, just a couple of these uh, mass chains. Like let's say you start on 134, you'd go step, step, and you'd be within 41 minutes and 52 minutes, you'd be at a stable nucleus. That one decays really quickly. This one, 12 minutes, 20 hours, 5 days, you're at a stable nucleus. Let's see if any of these guys are anybody that we know. Okay, here's the cesium-137. This one's got a long guy in it, 30 years. Uh, CZ-137 is a little bit of a troublemaker. Mega years? Mega years, yeah. Actually, believe it or not, believe it or not, that's not a, that's not a big deal. And then let me talk a little bit about when you have lots, well, I just got to talk about this when I was over at Mount Royal. Let's talk just a little bit about radioactivity because I had an erroneous notion of what radioactivity was. I thought that if you had something that had like a half-life of a day and you had something that had a half-life of a million years, it meant that the dude that was radioactive for a day is like, for a day and then oh, I'm done. And the dude who's half-life for a million years is like for a million years and then done. Okay, so you go, well, which one of these is more dangerous? Well, definitely the one that's got a half-life of a million years because that's got to be like radioactive forever and the dude that's radioactive for a day, that's not a big deal, right? Completely wrong. Okay, utterly backwards. The dude who's radioactive for a day is really, really radioactive. The dude who's radioactive for a million years is hardly radioactive at all. Which one of those two is more dangerous? The one that's radioactive for a day, by a long shot. Okay, so your radioactivity is directly and inversely proportional to your half-life. So somebody goes to you, there's something that's got half-life a million years. Scary, huh? And you're giving it to me, I'll put it in my hand. It's not gonna hurt me, it's not gonna hurt me. There's something that's half-life of a day, you wanna hold, no, no, keep it away from me, man. That stuff is hot, but it's going away fast too, right? So all these guys who have real short half-lives, very, very dangerous, but they're going away real quick. This guy, 2.3 million years, no problem. It's not going to hurt you. It's just not nearly radioactive enough. Another thing I learned about is some of these fission products have a really, really big propensity to eat neutrons. And the way they describe this in nuclear reactions is they call it a cross-section. It's a term that we use to describe how probable is a, is a reaction going to be. Well, one of those fission products is named xenon-135, and here is its cross-section relative to two nuclear fuels. Okay, see these little bitty guys? So imagine we're playing darts or something and throwing them. Which one are we going to hit? When xenon-135 forms from fission, you know, look at all these chains, blah, blah, blah. Where's 135? Ooh. Okay, that's not particularly an uncommon event to form that particular guy. And uh, xenon-135 has a half-life of nine hours. It's very radioactive, but during that nine hours, it really wants to eat your neutron. This turns out to be a big problem for real nuclear reactors. It messes up how they want to operate because of the existence of xenon. This actually was a contributing effect to the Chernobyl disaster, was the presence of, of xenon-135. And it's really hard to deal with in solid fuel reactors. But xenon is a gas, and gases well, where's my, where's my, well, if I open my Diet Coke, what happens to gases in a liquid? They come right out of solution. In a fluid fuel reactor, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but in a fluid fuel reactor, this, trouble, this troublemaker will come right out of the nuclear fuel and leave the reactor. That is a big, big, big deal. I have a friend I've, 
I've made online who is a nuclear reactor operator at a reactor in California. And uh, he jokes with me that he got interested in lifter and thorium when I told him about Xenon 135. It's like Jerry Maguire he goes, you had me a Xenon. You had me a Xenon, you know? <laughs> and I said, most people, you know, that's not what we get them at. But, but that's really kind of cool that you actually, and he goes, no, no, you don't understand. I'm always fighting Xenon in my reactor. That's like all we do as operators is try to deal with this stuff. Xenon was such a big deal. In fact, this was one of the first reactors that was ever built. This was the Hanford reactor in uh, Washington. They built this during the Manhattan Project to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. And when they first built it, they turned it on and everything seemed to be going. And after about a day or two of running it, all of a sudden the power went and dropped, like almost to zero. And they were like, what the heck is that? And they couldn't figure it out and they left it alone. And after about you know, 12, 18 hours, all of a sudden it went and it came back up to power again and it held there. And they're like, what? And then pretty soon it goes, Pew, and it drops off again. They're going, this makes no sense. We're not doing anything. The thing's like turning on and it's turning off. And it's turning on and it's turning off. Well, what was going on was the reactor would turn on and xenon-135 would begin to build up. And as it built up, it would start eating all those neutrons, right? And then it would, Pew, and it would take the reactor back down again. And then after a while, it would decay away. And once it decayed away, the reactor would come back on again. So it was following this up and down effect. Just crazy. I mean, these guys didn't even know what Xenon-135 was because this was like one of the first nuclear reactors ever built. Well, luckily for us, the guy who built this reactor was this guy, Eugene Wigner. He was unbelievably brilliant. Maybe one of the smartest guys ever lived. Won the Nobel Prize. Like, he would just lay in bed trying to figure out how far ahead of the Germans are we? Are we going to get the bomb before them? You know, what's going to happen if they get it? Where do you think they are? I mean, he was just always gaming it and trying to figure it out. He had thought, what could possibly go wrong in this machine I built? He goes, well, there could be something that we'll make that will be very, very absorptive of neutrons. We might make something. And that something we make might decay quickly. And if it was really absorptive and it decayed quickly, the reactor would do this. He didn't know what it was yet. He just was hypothesizing that such a thing existed. And so when this machine of his started doing this, he goes, I think I know what's going on. Well, the good thing was he had over-designed this reactor so there were a bunch of extra places to put in extra fuel, and he was able to override this effect. I mean, we're really lucky he did this, or we would not have been able to finish the Manhattan Project. So they were able to complete the creation of plutonium in order to make the first nuclear weapon. This looks like an eye, doesn't it? Ah, this is like, like Lord of the Rings, you know, ah, the great eye is looking at it. No, it's really not an eye. Here's what it really is. It's actually, it's a cross-section of nuclear fuel. This is uranium oxide, and when you put it in a reactor for a while, one of the things xenon does, it's a gas. So it's way, way, way less dense than solid fuel. So when you make this gas, it starts to break up the, the solid structure of the fuel. And when you run these, these reactors long enough, the solid fuel will begin to swell and crack, and the gases, the, the krypton and the xenon will begin to fill up, and you begin to get this central void. This is actually a, a gap in the fuel that will form under the fission process as fission product gases will, will accumulate here. Well, Victor didn't like solid fuel. He was a chemical engineer by training and he thought, what kind of industrial process do we run chemically based on solids? He goes, we don't. Everything we do, we use as liquids or gases because we can mix them completely. You can take a liquid, you can fully mix it. You can take a gas, you can fully mix it. You can't take a solid and fully mix it unless you turn it into a liquid or a gas. Now, to give you an idea, here's what we do today. We make this solid uranium oxide fuel, and there's a single pellet, and then we put them in these big reactor fuel elements, zirconium tubes that are like 12 feet long and about this big around. Then we stick them in the reactor. We irradiate them for a couple of years. We only burn up a small amount of the uranium that's in there. We take it out, and we stick it in a spent fuel pool. It is not very efficient. With our reactors in the United States, we're extracting about half of 1% of the energy that's in the uranium. With your reactors here in Canada, you're extracting about 0.7%. So, yo, yay Canada, all right, woo! Slightly less inefficient than we are, you know, feel good. Now, if any engineers out there are excited about less than 1%, you can imagine going to your boss saying, I developed a new system, but how efficient is it? It's less than 1%. <coughs> Excuse me, what did you build? I think you need to go work on that again, you know? I mean, we just simply wouldn't accept this. Why we accept this in nuclear is, it's still kind of a confuzzling me. Wigner did not accept it. He didn't like it at all. And he said, listen, here's what we need to do. 
we need to build nuclear reactors that aren't based on solid fuel. We need to build nuclear reactors that are based on liquid fuel because liquid fuel is going to be a whole lot better at doing a bunch of things. It's going to be easier to add fuel to it. It's going to be easier to take fuel out. And best of all, that xenon problem that we had back in Washington, that's going to just go away. This was another form of liquid fuel that was investigated. He started out with something based on water, but then rapidly had the idea of looking at salts. Salts have a lot going for them inside a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor is a rough place for normal matter. Uh, you've got a lot of neutrons that are slamming into things, knocking things around. You've also got gamma rays that are just blasting apart typical uh, bonds between atoms. The nice thing about a salt is a salt is formed from, well, a, a real simple salt. You know, might be some chemists in here that will challenge this. But a real simple salt is formed from a positive ion and a negative ion. Like you take sodium and it loses its electron to chlorine, for instance. Chlorine says, give me that electron. Now chlorine's got an extra electron and sodium's missing one. So sodium's positively charged and chlorine's negatively charged. And they go, hey, let's kind of hang out with each other. You know, we're not really going to bond. We're just going to kind of associate one with another, you know, and that's what's called an ionic bond. Some people say, well, that's not really a bond. It's like, yeah, you're kind of friends, you know, you're, you're not really married or anything. You just kind of hang out, you know. Facebook friends. Facebook, yeah, Facebook <laughs> friends. All right, well, it turns out this is a really good thing for a reactor because a reactor is going to take those guys and just smack them all over the place with gammas and neutrons and everything. And the good news is, is they don't really care who they particularly are next to. As long as there's an equal number of positive ions and negative ions, the big picture is happy. So it turns out salts are a pretty dang good idea for a medium inside a reactor. And this was Wigner's idea. He said, okay, you know, regular matter is just going to get the snot kicked out of it. Why don't we put in, um, put in salts? And then there was another really, really cool thing about salts. You want to be able to move the heat that's generated in the reactor around. You want to be able to move it to the power conversion system that's going to turn the heat into electricity. When we use water as a coolant, and our water-cooled reactors, be they heavy water, you know, oh Canada, or be they light water, you know, uh, God bless America, you know, um, either way, water is, is a tough medium to use in a reactor. Uh, number one, it's only got 100 degrees of liquid range, okay? Zero to 100 C. So that, that's not really particularly impressive. So to jack up water's liquid range, you have to put it under pressure. And our reactors, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, put water under extreme pressure. Uh, about 90 atmospheres in a can-do, about 150 atmospheres in a, an American reactor. So you've, I'm a scuba diver, you know, 3,000 PSI is about what your, your scuba dive tank is. Now make that tank 10 meters across full of, you know, nuclear fuel. And you see it's kind of a little bit of a challenge to do that. But we do that because that's the only way to get water to go up to 300 degrees C without turning into steam. You have to have that extreme pressure. And I would put out to you for consideration that that super high pressure is one of the basic challenges, difficulties, flaws, whatever you want to call it, of the water-cooled reactor approach. The salts, on the other hand, you have to heat them up to about 300 C before they melt. But once they melt, they have a thousand degrees C of liquid range. And they have excellent heat transfer properties. They can carry a lot of heat per unit volume, just like water. Water actually is really good from a heat transfer perspective. It's good at carrying heat per unit volume. Salts are just as good at carrying heat per unit volume, but salts don't have to be pressurized. And that, if you remember nothing else of what I say tonight, remember that one fact. Liquid salts can carry heat from the nuclear reactor environment and they don't have to be pressurized. And that is just a humongous deal because almost every good thing flows out of that. A salt, in a way, is kind of like a noble gas. It's got a full electron configuration. A noble gas fills up its outer layer with electrons. A salt is composed of the stuff that's in this column, the halogens, and the stuff that's in the, these columns, the alkalis and the alkaline earths. That configuration put together behaves a lot like a noble gas. It's very, very stable. So these salts they don't want to react with anything else. This is another very, very good feature in a reactor. You don't want to build a reactor out of stuff that wants to be something else. It wants to burn, react, anything. You want to go, whatever I've made you out of, I want it to be like the rock bottom of stability. I don't want there to be no step further down that is chemically favorable because that's how things burn. Fluorine is so reactive with everything, but once it's made a salt, a fluoride, 
then it's incredibly chemically stable and non-reactive. So sometimes people go, oh, you're working on liquid fluorine reactors. No, I am not working on liquid fluorine reactors. We're going to with fluoride reactors, and there's a big difference between those two. One is going to explode. The other one is like super duper stable. So this salt that we favor is actually a combination of lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride. And individually, they both have very high melting temperatures, lithium fluoride like 850C, uh, beryllium fluoride about 550C. But if you put them together in the right combination, you can nurse that melting point down. This is called the eutectic. You can nurse it all the way down to about 360C. Now that's still hot, but that's about the temperature you want to start running your reactor anyway. If you're not putting heat in your reactor at a high enough temperature, you can't drive a power conversion system efficiently. This is why we have to have pressurized water. Water is, is really hurting just to get even close to this point, to get water pressurized to that point where we can start adding heat. But ideally, the higher temperature we can go, the better the system is going to work. Now, into that lithium beryllium mixture, we then add other things, either thorium fluoride or uranium fluoride. And, and it's still mostly lithium beryllium. We only add a small amount of, of thorium uranium fluoride now, what about thorium and uranium? Well, let's talk a little bit about what's in them. Both are naturally occurring materials. Thorium has only one isotope, thorium-232. It has a 14 billion year half-life. So when the universe is twice as old as it is now, thorium will have only decayed one half-life. Okay. So based on what I just told you about radioactivity, what does that tell you about how radioactive thorium is? Not Hardly at all. It means no big deal. That's why it's still around. Okay, uranium. Two isotopes, uranium-235, uranium-238, both, of course, are radioactive. U-238 has a 5 billion year half-life. That's pretty old. That's about how old the Earth is. That's how old the Earth is. That's how old the universe is. So uh, uranium-235, on the other hand, much shorter half-life, 700 million years. So that means back when the Earth was formed 5 billion years ago, there was a lot more uranium-235 back then than there is now. Somebody wondered one time, Okay, billions of years ago, that means there was a lot more uranium-235 and natural nuclear reactors might have been possible. I wonder if a natural nuclear reactor ever happened and they found out it did. It probably happened in many places, but there's one place in particular that we found in Africa at a place called Oklo in the Gabon and they found, based on the uh, certain leftovers from fission, they were able to identify that about three billion years ago there were scores of natural nuclear reactors there that were nothing more than uranium ore in the rock and the water would come in and it would lead to a nuclear reaction. And these reactors ran for hundreds of millions of years. So this is like absolute, you know, nature hacking on, on the building blocks of, of, of the world and, and built itself a nuclear. So we did not invent nuclear fission, all right? It was done long, long, long before we were here and very successfully. And, and one of the interesting things they've been able to figure out at Gabon is they've been able to do experiments. I'm like, okay, like let's say you had a nuclear reactor where the sea was just totally like washing in. How far do fission products and plutonium and other things get? And they were able to figure out uh, the answer was not nearly as far. And it helped them benchmark certain models with regards to like Yucca Mountain. Like, total aside, but I think it's just super interesting that nature was able to uh, pull off a, a natural nuclear reaction. Okay, how common is this stuff in the Earth? Well, it's not super common, but it's not super uncommon either. Okay, what is the crust of the Earth made of? If you had a ton of stuff, how many grams are each thing? Uh, most of the Earth's made out of oxygen. Isn't that strange? Like 46% of the crust of the Earth is oxygen. Whoa, really? Seriously? It's because everything's oxidized, all the rocks. So then silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, a bunch of stuff. Okay, we get down here. Well, here's thorium at 10 parts per million. But there's other stuff that we think of that's, you know, even less common, beryllium, tin, tungsten. Here's uranium, two and a half parts per million. Tungsten, molybdenum, mercury, silver. You know, no surprise, where's gold? That's why girls want you to give it to them, because it's so darn rare. Well, I guess they also want you to give them carbon, too, but they want the carbon in a very, very particular form, you know. Now, let's say we were looking at uranium-235 as if it was its own thing, okay? Not as if it was... It's, it's less than 1% of uranium. It's about 0.7% of uranium. So I put on this chart and I said, okay, this isn't really real, but I'm just going to think about it anyway. If this was uranium-235, you can see that uranium-235 is like on par with the abundance of silver and platinum, all right? Can you imagine burning platinum for energy, you know? I mean, that would just be nuts. And it is nuts. And that's literally what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff 
and we're not burning the common stuff, the uranium-238 and the thorium. We're leaving that stuff unburned. Now, sometimes I, I, I get in a little bit of discussion with, uh, with you know, some people who are kind of environmentalists, and they say, listen, nuclear power is not sustainable, they say to me. They go, I can't, you know, this is not a green solution. We're going to run out of uranium. And I said, okay, I will yield that point to you if we're talking about today's nuclear technology. And on the other hand, if we start thinking about some of these other things we can do, that story changes, okay? But yeah, if you just want to burn uranium-235, we will run out of it because we just don't have enough high-grade reserves to go get it. It's not that it's that uncommon. It's just that it's hard to find uh, sources that are rich enough to make it worth mining. Okay, well, what about thorium? Well, what's so neat about thorium was in this book. So I started learning about it. The basic idea is thorium all by itself is not going to release nuclear energy. But if you hit the thorium with a neutron, and we'll explain where that neutron came in just a minute, the, the, new, the thorium will absorb the neutron and it will turn from thorium-232 into thorium-233. Now thorium-233 only has a half-life of like 20 minutes. So is it really radioactive? Yeah. Oh yeah, smoking radioactive. Really, really hot stuff. You don't want to mess with your thorium-233. It's going to decay into protactinium-233, which has a half-life of about a month. Is it radioactive or less radioactive? Less, less radioactive, but still pretty, pretty darn hot stuff. You probably don't want to mess with this stuff either and then it will decay over about a month to uranium-233, which has a half-life about 160,000 years. Okay, much less radioactive. Uranium-233, if you hit it with a neutron, it will fission. It will split, like we, that, that chart I showed you earlier. But the cool thing is, in addition to releasing all that energy, it will release two or three additional neutrons. So you need one of those neutrons to go find another thorium, and you need another one of those neutrons to find another uranium-233 to continue the reaction. Let me tell you how this stuff was discovered. There was a guy named Glenn Seaborg who worked at Berkeley Labs in California in 1942. This was a guy who had discovered plutonium. And he had, coming off discovering plutonium, he thought, I wonder if we could hit thorium with a neutron and turn it, I mean, turn it into something. Again, remember, the neutron had been discovered like, very, very, well, fission had been discovered like three years earlier, so they were still in the very beginnings. So he got this grad student, you know, everybody who's been a grad student knows what it's like when the professor says, all right, I want you to go into the nuclear lab and turn on the neutron bombardment system and expose this sample of radioactive material and find out what happens. <laughs> it's a war right now, isn't it, sir, right? I could be on the front lines. Yes, you could. Okay, yes, sir, absolutely. Off I go. So the grad student went off and he did the experiment and he came back to Seaborg and he said, yep, I've done it, sir. I have, I have made something new. Thorium did absorb the neutron. It became uranium-233. Isn't that cool? Seaborg said, yes, absolutely. Okay, now let's take the next step, poor little grad student. I want you to go back and now I want you to, uh, to hit it with a neutron and see if it will fission. Because I think it'll fission. I think it'll fission just like uranium-235. Okay, yes, sir. Goes off, does the experiment, comes back and says, yep, you were right. It did fission. You're correct. It's a new form of nuclear fuel. And Seaborg popped the really, really, really important question. He said, now I want you to go figure out how many neutrons came off when it fissioned. Because if that number is below two, we really don't have a story here. If this number, you come back and it says it's like 1.5, then eh, interesting fact goes in the back of the book. But if that number is above two, then that is a big deal. Goes back, comes back. Sir, the number is 2.5. Seaborg looks at his grad student, this is December 1942, and he said, you've just made a 50 quadrillion dollar discovery. Grad student's like, ah. <laughs> Seaborg was absolutely right. He had figured out that thorium could serve as an essentially unlimited nuclear fuel. And he knew how abundant thorium was in the crust of the earth, and he realized that through this process, you could actually sustain the burning of thorium. Now, of course, you're fissioning uranium-233, but you're making a new one. So it's not really a catalyst in the true chemical sense that a catalyst is not consumed in a reaction, but you can almost think about it as a pseudo-catalyst. If you had some uranium-233, you could catalyze the burning of thorium indefinitely. Unlimited cosmic power from thorium. <laughs> well, maybe not quite that. It's pretty good. It's pretty darn good. Well, this was wartime, you know, 1942. What Seaborg had done was he had already discovered plutonium. And here's what their plan was to make bombs. 
They took natural uranium and they separated those two isotopes. Highly enrich it in uranium-235. They take uranium-235 from less than 1% up to like 90 plus percent. And this was really hard. It took big factories. It's very difficult to do isotopic enrichment. But this is how they made the uranium for the first uh, nuclear weapon used in war. This was the bomb at Hiroshima. It was called Little Boy. And they never tested it because they already knew it was going to work. Was never, this bomb was never tested. Then they said, well, what can we do with all this junk uranium-238, the 99.3% of it? Well, Seaborg had already figured out you could expose it to neutrons and you could make it into plutonium. Now, plutonium is a different chemical element than uranium, so they can be chemically separated. And chemically separating things is like a bazillion times easier than isotopically separating it. Because isotopically, uranium-235 and uranium-238 are like identical chemically. There's no chemical difference between them. But there is a chemical difference between plutonium and uranium. So it was a lot easier to do a chemical separation of the plutonium you'd made. And that's how they made the first nuclear weapon, the Trinity Blast uh, in New Mexico. And that's also how they made the Nagasaki bomb, which was called uh, Fat Man. It was a plutonium implosion bomb, and that was what they didn't know if it was going to work or not. So that's why they did the Trinity test, was to figure out if the implosion technique actually worked. Seaborg says, okay, well, maybe we can do the same thing with thorium. Maybe we can expose it to neutrons, and we can make it into uranium-233. Uranium will be chemically separable from thorium, and we can go make a bomb out of it, right? Sounds great. So they started looking at it, and it turns out, no, it's a really bad idea. Because as you made the uranium-233, you were always making uh, a stuff called uranium-232. You didn't make a lot of it. You only made a little bit of it. But uranium-232 had a 60-year half-life, so it was much more radioactive than uranium-233. Here's the decay chain that uranium-232 is on. It jumps down, you know, one year, three days, 55 seconds, 0.16 seconds. And it jumps down to these guys, uh, bismuth-212, and thallium-208. And these two decay products have hard gamma emissions. They put out very, very strong gamma rays. And these gamma rays are just super bad news if you want to go and build a practical nuclear device because uh, they do a few things. Number one, they kill you when you work on them. Uh, number two, they tell everybody where the stuff is. You know, anybody who's got a gamma ray detector. So really quickly, they were going, okay, we can work with uranium-235, that seems okay. We can work with plutonium, that seems okay. But this uranium-233 stuff, that's bad news for making a nuclear weapon. Thorium was just set aside as a potential uh, nuclear weapons fuel all during the war. Well, after the war, they picked up on this again because now they were thinking, let's talk about making power instead of making nuclear weapons. Because when it comes to making power, there's a pretty good story. Now, this is a funny graph. Squiggly lines, blah, 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 blah. And I, I, I've told people before that I think you could probably tell the entire history of the development of nuclear energy in this one graph. And I'll tell you why. How much energy did the neutron have that you smacked the nuclear fuel with? Okay, how much energy did it have? And then how many neutrons did you kick out when you smacked it through fission? All right, if you slow neutrons down, they're going to have energies like in this range. Slowing down neutrons is a big deal. This is a chart that shows those, the, the, the absorption propensity of each of these different nuclear fuels as a function of neutron energy. Okay, this is what's called thermal energy. This means they've been slowed way down. Okay, this is fast energy. That means the neutron is still going really fast. Look how much bigger the cross sections are in thermal than they are in fast. Okay, well, what's this guy down here? This is fast times 25. So I've taken this row, because you can barely see it's these little bitty dots, and I've blown it up by a factor of 25, so you can see some proportions here. Now what these colors mean is the red means that it's going to absorb the neutron, and the blue means that it's going to absorb the neutron in fission. So what you want, you want blue. Big blue is good. You want lots of blue, because when you hit these dudes with a neutron, you want them to fission. Okay, well look at plutonium. Wow, big target, right? But one third of the time, it's just going to eat the neutron in thermal fission. That's not good. On the other hand, in fast fission, look at that. Wow, was well, going to fission almost all the time. We like that. But look how tiny, how many of these little dots are we going to need to add up to this size? We're going to need a lot. So this is why it was a big deal to be able to have performance in this region of the curve. Those little bitty dots. They're up here in this part of the curve. Okay, this is the fast region. 
This is the thermal region. Well, in the thermal region, look who's doing the best. Look at uranium-233, about 2.3. And you actually have to integrate this whole area to get the effect. It's still real good over that whole region. Okay, look at plutonium. Eh, it's that dip below 2 right there. That's what makes it so you cannot burn up uranium-238 in a thermal spectrum reactor, like a water-cooled reactor, like a can-do or a light water reactor. You just can't do it. The physics are against you. And the reality is you do lose some neutrons. You can't build a perfect reactor that doesn't lose any neutrons. So they looked at this and they said, man, we just can't burn uranium-238 in a thermal reactor. It just can't be done. It can't be done, Captain. It cannot be done, you know? Well, you know, these guys are undeterred. They said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just build a fast reactor, because look how good it gets in the fast region. Wow, it gets above two, three. Wow, this is really good. So this was the genesis of the idea of the fast breeder reactor, a reactor that was based around having fast neutrons and plutonium fuel. But uranium-233, on the other hand, okay, yeah, it gets a little better in the fast, but dang, it's still pretty dang good right here in the thermal. Big targets, a lot easier. Everybody who was pushing thorium said, we like thermal. This is the kind of reactor we want to build. And everybody who was pushing plutonium said, no, 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 no. We want a fast reactor. That's the only way to do it. Okay, so this became the real fork in the road. But what did we really do? We didn't do either one of these in reality. All our reactors today are burning uranium-235, which is like burning platinum. You know, very, very, very rare. So we didn't take either one of these paths ultimately. But I want to tell you, this was the great division in the beginning. Was is it going to be thorium or is it going to be plutonium? Wigner was not successful in convincing the bulk of the nuclear community to take the thorium approach. They, by and large, said, we're going to go the plutonium route. And one of the reasons why was they had developed a great deal of understanding about plutonium from the weapons program. They had made the stuff. They had worked with its chemistry. They'd made fuel out of it. They go, we get this. Thorium, we haven't really messed with thorium. You know, it would be like starting over. So that propensity there was to go and do what you already knew how to do. And the plutonium was so much better developed than the thorium. So Wigner was not terribly successful in making converts in the nuclear community. But he did make one convert, this guy, Alvin Weinberg. He was his student during the Manhattan Project. Weinberg got it. He got the big picture. He got, we need thorium, we need thermal reactor, we need liquid fuel. I see it. I see what we got to do. Weinberg got a job offer to be the director of Oak Ridge National Labs in 1955. He was 35 years old. He was a year younger than I am. I'm sitting there going, dude, when Weinberg was my age, he was running Oak Ridge National Lab. What am I doing? I'm, I'm in a basement somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my mom's basement, so I feel better. <laughs> so he goes to Oak Ridge, and Wigner said, he said, Alvin, you got to go there because you got to go see if you can make this thorium work. It's that important. And, Wig and Alvin got it. Here was a quote from his book. He said, until then, I had never quite appreciated the full significance of the breeder. And when he's talking about breeder, he actually means the thorium reactor. But now I became obsessed with the idea that humanity's whole future depended on the breeder. The idea that if you don't go and access the energies of thorium, we're not going to make it. We can't make it on the uranium-235. And one of the first things that happened when he got to Oak Ridge was the Atomic Energy Commission called him up and said, you're done in the reactor business. We're giving all the reactor work to Argonne National Labs in uh, Chicago, and you guys Aren't, aren't, aren't part of the deal anymore. And Argonne National Labs was fully going for the plutonium fast breeder. I mean, that was their whole thing, was to do the plutonium fast breeder. So right off the bat, Weinberg was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Well, about that time, the Air Force came along and they said, okay, the Navy has built their nuclear submarines and the Army has come along and they have taken the same technology as the Navy, the water-cooled reactor, and they're doing their thing but the Air Force wants to build a nuclear-powered bomber. I mean, does that just sound like crazy? <laughs> it was just absolutely nuts. Now, Weinberg was a practical man, and he said, huh, nuclear-powered bomber, that is like probably a really, really, really dumb idea. <laughs> but the military has a lot of money. It wasn't that I'd suddenly become converted to a belief in nuclear airplanes. It was rather this was the only avenue open for ORNL for continuing in reactor development. That the purpose was unattainable, if not foolish, was not so important. 
A high temperature reactor could be useful for other purposes, even if it never propelled an airplane. And I would maintain that Weinberg was absolutely right in his assessment of the situation back then. He knew that to make the nuclear airplane work, they couldn't use water-cooled reactors. They couldn't use high-pressure reactors. They couldn't use complicated solid fuel reactors. They had to have something that was so slick, that was so safe, that was so simple, that operated at low pressure, high temperatures, had all the features you wanted in it. They didn't even know what it was. All they knew is it's got to be this. So he puts his team to work on it. And I would, I would, I would put out to you that this is probably... Uh, I think someday this will be looked at as one of the great pivot points of history. That if this program, this nuclear airplane program, had not been established, the molten salt reactor would have never been invented. Because it is simply too radical, too different, too completely out of the ball field of everything else for it to be arrived at through an evolutionary development. It had to be forced into existence by requirements that were so difficult to achieve and the nuclear airplane was that so they began working on this high temperature reactor and here was their notion this reactor was going to produce its high temperature heat it was going to be ducted into a turbojet engine the air was going to be sucked in compressed and then instead of a burner here that would be injecting fuel like a combustion system you would have this heat exchanger with the reactor it would make the air hot then the air would exhaust through the turbine and make thrust so it's the same idea as a jet engine, it's just the heat source was the reactor rather than the combustion of fuel. And this is the plane it was going to be on, kind of what it looked like. You can see they've taken the jet engines off these wings and they put them right here under the fuselage. They probably had a little bit of uh, combustion engines just to get them off the ground. But th remember, this was invented before we had ICBMs or anything like this. It was a doomsday weapon. I mean, this is like, if you're flying this thing to Russia, it's the end of the world, you know. You're going to nuke them, you're going to bomb them. And you know, there was no mid-air refueling. All these other technologies didn't exist. That's why they had to have a nuclear-powered bomber. But boy, was it hard. So they didn't even know what kind of reactor this would be. And they began working and came up with the molten salt concept. And they didn't know if it would work. So they built this proof-of-principle reactor called the Aircraft Reactor Experiment. Only ran for 100 hours, but it reached the highest temperatures that had ever been achieved by a nuclear reactor up to that point. Ran from uh, November 3rd of 1954 to November 12th, 1954. They circulated the liquid fluoride salt in these tubes. It was a little bit of an interesting combination. It produced two and a half megawatts of thermal power. But a couple of things they proved. One was that the gaseous fission product, xenon, just came right out of the salt. That was a humongous deal because that meant that the reactor would be self-controlling and stable. You know, can you imagine if what happened to Poor Wigner in his Washington reactor happened to the, uh, the dude flying to Russia. He'd be like, this is your captain speaking. We're going to have to make an emergency landing over Siberia. Xenon level is just getting a little too high in the reactor back there. So we're just going to set down on the uh, tundra here for nine hours while uh, that old Xenon's going to come on down and we'll be lighting up and taking off shortly. You know, I mean, that's not going to work. You have got to have a reactor that simply doesn't have that problem. And, and this was the only way to do it. So they figured that out. It also was very responsive. As the salt would heat up and expand, there would be less fuel in the core. And so the fission rate would go down and the salt would cool. Conversely, as the salt got too cool, the salt would contract. There'd be more fuel in the core. The fission rate would go up. And what that meant was, you know, you engineers out there, that's a dynamically stable system. Okay? It will naturally follow the signal. You know, more power, the reactor produces more power. Less power demand, the reactor... And it does this not by moving control rods or by having any operator intervention. No computers, no valves, no nothing. It's just the physics. It's the physics of how it works. So now, they had a problem. They didn't have a material that was good at holding these fluoride salts. And shortly after they built the reactor, they came up with this stuff, Hastelloy N. And it's a nickel-based alloy, very stable against the fluoride. See, the fluorides are so stable that they want everybody else to be as stable as they are. So they go, oh, you metal. Wouldn't you rather be a fluoride than a metal? It's much happier being a fluoride. Here, here's some fluorides. You can borrow them and we'll corrode you. You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the basic mechanism, all right? So the way you got around it was you had to have a really stable metal combination. And you also had to have salts in there that were so stable that they didn't want to give up their fluorines to anybody. Okay, so between the lithium beryllium salt and this nickel alloy, they were able to lick that problem. So that was a first big step. Uh, here's a chart of the free energies of formation of these fluorides. And these are the numbers of your corrosion products. You want the numbers of your 
of your stuff to be a lot lower than that. So negative 125 versus negative 66. Good. Big spacing there. That's good. You want that. That means fluorine would rather be attached to lithium than attached to nickel or chromium or anything else. A lot of times you'll people say fluoride salts are corrosive. And I want to say you can't ever say something is corrosive without saying what it's corrosive in. Water tends to be really corrosive in sugar, you know, I mean, <laughs> it'll go right after it, but it isn't so corrosive in concrete. So, you know, I mean, you have to say what it is you're, you're putting things up against. Uh, fluoride salts are corrosive in a lot of things, but in this particular alloy with the right fluoride combination, they were okay. So the, the Oak Ridge guys, the Oak Ridge boys, got really excited and they wanted to build a better one. They wanted to build something a whole lot closer to the big system. So they came up with this thing called the Fireball. It was much bigger, 60 megawatts instead of 2 megawatts, had great core power density, and they were going to simulate this nuclear aircraft. Well, by this time it was about 1960, uh, ICBMs were going great, we'd perfected air-to-air -air refueling, the Air Force was going, oh man, I don't think we really need that nuclear bomber anymore. So they pulled the plug on the funding, and they said, okay, we're, we're out of this. Weinberg was not surprised, because he didn't really think the nuclear bomber is going to get built anyway. He'd already gotten what it was he really wanted, which was the invention of a safe high temperature reactor. What Weinberg did was he went and he got money from the Atomic Energy Commission to build another molten salt reactor, this time focused on terrestrial power and thorium. It turned out that thorium was a great fit in this reactor. This was the notion that Weinberg and his folks came up with for how to use thorium in a molten salt reactor. This is what's called a two fluid uh, molten salt reactor design. The idea is you've got this core fluid and it's a lithium beryllium salt with uranium tetrafluoride in there. So this salt comes up into the core region and fission reactions take place. Neutrons are produced, the salt gets hot, the hot salt leaves up here at the top. I'll show you what happens to it in the next slide. Now these nuclear reactions, about half of those neutrons are continuing the reaction. The other half are being absorbed in this blue thorium blanket. Is it really blue? Well, no, not really, but it helps you see it here. Okay, it's lithium, beryllium, thorium fluoride. So some of that thorium is getting turned into uranium-233. Now what you want to do is you want to move that fuel you've made from the blanket into the core. And here's how you do it. You take a stream of this blanket salt off and you put it in this fluoride volatility column. You hit the salt with fluorine gas. And what will happen is uranium has two kinds of fluorine states it'll be in. There's uranium tetrafluoride, four fluoride ions, and then there's uranium hexafluoride, which is six fluoride ions. Uranium hexafluoride is a gas. Uranium tetrafluoride is in solution. If you hit it with fluorine, it will start to bubble out of the salt, just like bubbles in your pop. And that's great, because this is a neat trick. This is a way to get your uranium product to come out of the blanket and leave everything behind. This wouldn't work if thorium also had this same trick. If thorium would turn into a hexafluoride and a gas, eh we'd be up the creek. This is one of these little miracles of nature. Thorium only has one fluoride state, not two. Oh, thank goodness. This wouldn't work otherwise. So you can sit there and pound thorium with fluorine all you want. It's not going to change. It's going to stay in solution. But the uranium will come out as uranium hexafluoride, a gas. Well, now you need to move it into the core salt. So you bring a stream of core salt over here, and you introduce this uranium hexafluoride here, and now you hit it with a little hydrogen gas. The hydrogen will say to UF6, hey man, I want those two fluorines a whole lot worse than you do. And, uh, you know, UF6 gets, gets stuck up at the, at, the, at the gas station, has to give up two fluorines, you know, and drops from UF6 back to UF4, whoop, it's in solution now. So now you've just refueled your core salt with uranium tetrafluoride. So cool trick, huh? So then you send your fuel salt back, it's been refueled. So in one sense, you're continuously refueling your reactor all the time. You're always refueling the core with new uranium-233, and uranium-233 is being consumed, but the neutrons from the fission are making new uranium-233. Okay, well, out of the top of this column comes hydrofluoric acid, HF. You send that down to this electrolyzer unit, and you hit it with some electricity, and the HF will split into hydrogen gas and fluorine gas. And guess what? Now you've regenerated your two reactants. So your fluorine and your hydrogen are ready for duty again to make this trick work. I mean, this is a piece you can actually buy off the shelf. So this is pretty cool. This is a closed cycle for how to get your new fuel from here into here. You're essentially converting thorium into energy, first into U-233 and then into energy through fission. Now, of course, you're using up some thorium doing this, so you need to have a little feed of thorium fluoride. You need to feed some new thorium into the blanket 
to make up for the thorium that you're consuming. But very, very efficient reaction. Hot salt will exit the reactor through a heat exchanger. You want to give up the heat that's in this salt to another salt. This salt won't be radioactive. It's just lithium beryllium salt. It's not, there's nothing in it. Okay, but this is good hot salt, and then you can move that out of the reactor unit over to where the power conversion system is. And this salt will then heat up a gas, which will run a gas turbine. Now, almost all of our reactors today are based on steam turbines. They're based on boiling water, running a steam turbine, and then condensing that water. That's why we have big cooling towers. That's why we have to place our reactors by rivers or lakes, is because we use this steam turbine power conversion system. Now, we don't use that because we're stupid. We use it because the limitations of pressurized water mean that you can't get, the, you can't get it all that hot. I mean, the reactor just doesn't get that hot. It gets about 300 C, which is modestly hot, but not all that hot. And the steam turbine's the best fit for those temperatures. With this reactor, we can get up to more like 7 or 800 C. And at those temperatures, the gas turbine turns out to be a better fit. And you can get about 50% conversion efficiency with the gas turbine. So you can generate electricity from the gas turbine, and you've got to cool the gas. You know, every thermodynamic cycle has to reject waste heat. Well, even that cooling gas can be directed, if you're near a coastal body, you can take seawater in and you can desalinate it. So even the waste heat from the system doesn't have to be wasted if you're near a, a coastal area. Maybe even bigger than the energy crisis we're facing is a water crisis. We've got billions of people and we need fresh water and we only have so many rivers in the world and everybody's already living next to them. How do you get lots and lots of fresh water? Okay, this isn't going to work for Calgary, obviously, but, you know, most people don't live as far inland as here. <laughs> okay, so this is a way that we can use a system that's going to make electricity anyway and something we're going to throw away anyway, waste heat, to desalinate seawater and we can produce a lot of desalinated seawater this way. Well, why aren't we desalinating seawater today? Well, some places we are, but usually it's because it's really expensive. We're burning fossil fuels to desalinate seawater. That's not a good idea. In this case, it's, it's very little, essentially almost no economic penalty to desalinate seawater. Uh, there's other things we could do. If we were in Calgary, we could use air cooling to cool the gas turbine rather than reject it to water. And that way we wouldn't have to have the system near a body of water. If you get away from the steam turbine, if you go to the gas turbine, you can actually get away from the requirement to have to have big bodies of water that reactors are next to. You know, growing up in Utah, I remember thinking, how come we don't have any reactors in the West? You know, why don't we have nuclear power? Well, it's because we're using steam turbines and we don't have big rivers and lakes. This can really decouple a reactor from having to be near a big body of water. And this is where a lot of people's opposition to nuclear energy comes from. They're like, oh, you know, nuclear energy is consuming, you know, fresh water supplies, it's consuming rare uranium supplies, it operates at high pressure, you know, there's safety issues, blah, 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 blah. Especially since the, the Japanese incident, a lot of people uh, are very concerned about nuclear safety and what's really going on. Well, let me introduce you to a typical nuclear reactor. Watts Bar Plant in Tennessee, I've actually been to this nuclear reactor before. This has the distinction of being the newest nuclear reactor in the United States. This came online in 1996. There's actually two reactors there. The first one was finished and has been operating since 1996. The second one was not finished. It was stopped in, in the mid-80s, has remained unfinished ever since. A few years ago, they began working on it to complete it. Each of these two cooling towers, one is for one reactor, one is for the other. You'll see steam come out of one. Steam has never come out of the second one, ever, and won't until they turn the second reactor on. So kind of a bummer, build all that. And essentially, this is what's going on inside of Watts Bar, a big pressurized water reactor vessel, 150 atmospheres, solid nuclear fuel, fission is going on, water is being pumped through, it's getting hotter. This water then goes through a steam generator and in another loop of water, steam is being raised. It goes to the turbine, spins the turbine, which spins the generator, makes electricity. The steam that has uh, lost all that pressure then goes through this condenser. I've actually seen the condenser at Watts Bar, big unit, and it is having cold water running through it that's going to the cooling tower, it then returns into the steam generator. So there's two water loops. There's this one and there's this one. In a boiling water reactor, like in Japan, there's just one water loop. The boiling takes place in the reactor and then goes directly to the turbine. Can-dos have a similar arrangement in the sense that they have heavy water, though, in this loop, steam being raised in another loop. Uh, I think they use heavy, actually, I think they use heavy water in both loops in most can-dos. But, you know, all of them based on water cooling. This is the reactor itself, the reactor vessel. Up here is where all the control rods slide in and out of the core. And then there's these four steam generators. You see the steam generators at Watts Bar are as big, if not bigger, than the reactors, and they also have to operate at these very high pressures. There's four of them. Look at that. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Big pipes. The number one accident people worry about with this kind of reactor is what's called a double-ended pipe break. One of these eight pipes, for whatever reason, shears. And all of a sudden, pressure is lost in the reactor. That water that's being held water at 300 Celsius by 150 atmospheres of pressure, when you lose pressure, it flashes to steam, almost instantly to steam. And when that happens, uh, its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. So what was yay dense is now not so dense anymore. The other thing that happens is steam doesn't uh, take away heat nearly as well as liquid water does from a surface. So all of a sudden your fuel rods are not being cooled nearly as effectively as they were before. Now fission will stop because one of the things the water is doing, it's slowing down the neutrons. So without the water, the fission reaction stops. You don't have to put control rods in or anything. The reactors, it will turn off immediately. But it will still be generating heat from those fission products. Here's what will happen. If you have a double-ended pipe break, you get this entire containment vessel filled with water. Now, the reason I want to, I don't want to tell you all this because I'm trying to focus on negative situations here. I'm telling you this because this is what drives the design of this building. This building is the size it is, and it's the way it is, precisely to accommodate this event. They've designed this reactor so if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building and doesn't get out. And it's really kind of nifty. This is, a, this is the whole idea of a containment building. But the containment building, I mean, look. Look at the size of the reactor. Look at the size of the containment building. It's huge. It's much, much, much bigger than the reactor, and that's all driven by that thousand to one difference in the density between steam and, uh, and liquid water. Now if this happens, you have to figure out a way to get water back on the fuel rods to cool them. So they have a series of emergency systems in this reactor and they operate at all different stages of pressure. They have one called high head liquid injection, medium head liquid injection, and low head liquid injection. And head is another uh, engineering term for pressure. So the idea is if you're still at high pressure and you've got to get water in there, we've got a system for that. If you've lost some of your pressure and you've got to get water in there, we've got a system for that. If you've lost all your pressure and we've got to get water in there, we've got a system for that. So there's a lot of systems and then there's backups to those systems. But if this all sounds complicated to you, well, that's because it is. <laughs> it is complicated. And it's all driven by this high pressure and by the use of water. In fact, at Watts Bar, it has a feature that a lot of other reactors don't have. I mean, you can see it says ice condenser. They have these gigantic, absolutely gigantic, I don't know what to call them. They're like giant open freezers, giant sheets of ice. And the whole reason they're there is so that if the steam comes out, it hits this ice, and the steam will condense more quickly, and it will reduce the pressure. By putting those steam condensers in here, believe it or not, this building is actually quite a bit smaller than it would have to be if they didn't have the ice condensers in there. But again, I hate it in engineering when you're fighting against yourself in a design. So you got a building that's got a reactor that's putting out three gigawatts of heat. And look at that, like, you know, 20 meters away, you've got this giant wall of open, intentionally open sheets of ice. And you can't insulate it or keep it or hide it from the rest of the building because it's there exactly to do that. Can you imagine how much juice they're spending to uh, keep this gigantic icicle in place <laughs> inside this building? At the same time, you've got this three gigawatt heat source. I mean, it's like, it's like having a walk-in freezer and bringing in this giant like 15,000 BTU furnace, you know, and turning it on and going, man, my energy demand's really going up. Well, it might have something to do with that big old furnace you turned on inside your freezer. I've talked to some guys at Watts Bar and they said, Knowing what we know now, we would have never in a million years ever put this stupid ice condenser in here. We would have just built the dang building half again bigger. Because it would have been so much cheaper to just spend the money on the concrete and the rebar to build a bigger building than to go and try to maintain this dumb giant ice condenser for all these years. Yes, sir. Is the uh, control rod missile shield to keep uh, the control rods from punching a hole through the roof if the uh, steam explosion breaches the reactor chamber? Precisely. <laughs> I, I just didn't know if... Yeah, uh, here's the rods. They're right, here's the control rod drive mechanism. Here's the rods. If you breach this part, let's say the, the welding fails, and this thing goes boom and sh out shoots the control rods, well, that's there to keep them from doing bad things like punching a hole in the top of the...
Yeah, I, and that actually did happen one time. Now that reactor was a it was a, not a civilian reactor; it was an army reactor, and it did not have a containment building. But one poor guy got impaled to the ceiling by a control rod. So, oh my gosh. Hmm. it's gotta be the coolest way to die. That was a real bad day. If he didn't get impaled; the radiation was gonna get him. So, is that saying that's 13 inches thick? That steel shell. That is. I, it can't be 13. Can that be 13? That's no, no, it might be an elevation. Well, to give you an idea, the, the reactor vessel is about nine inch thick steel. I mean, it's really thick. And when you got nine inch thick steel and it has to be nuclear grade and it has to be perfect, you can't go and weld nine inch thick steel. You know, that just, <laughs> that just doesn't work. So they don't make it that way. They have a very heavy forging capability. They forge it in one piece. Not a lot of people have the capability to build a 10 meter diameter 20 meter long, single piece, nine inch thick forging. In fact, there's exactly one place in the world you can build this. It's a place called Japan Steelworks in Japan. But I'm told they are backed up indefinitely making single casting forgings for new pressurized water reactors. It's a limiting factor if you say, I want to build lots and lots of nuclear reactors. You got to go, well, either you're going to build a new heavy forging, which is really just for this task, or you're going to wait a long time to make a heavy forging capability or to get your reactor in line to go do this. So That applies to the Candu heavy reactor? The Candus are different. Each of their tubes is a pressure tube. So they have high pressure, but because their tubes are so much smaller, um, I'm getting a little engineering here, but uh, the thickness, your wall, is proportional to the overall diameter of the vessel. It's called, a, I think it's hoop stress. It's been a while since I did that. I remember doing this as an undergrad. So when you reduce that diameter, like from 10 meters down to like 2 centimeters, I don't know how big a can do. A can do bundle, I think, is about this big around. So maybe 20 centimeters. So you take it from 10 meters to 20 centimeters, the thickness goes way down that you have to have to have the same pressure. And can do's actually don't operate as high as a PWR. They, they're not 150 atmospheres, they're only 90 atmospheres. See, only 90. No biggie, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's still a pain. Okay, so let me diss on water a few more times. Uh, here's why water is not such a great thing for the inside of a nuclear reactor. Number one, it can't hack the temperature. We already talked about that. Number two, it's a covalently bonded substance. The oxygen has a covalent bond with two hydrogens. Well, neither one of those bonds is strong enough to survive getting smacked around by a gamma or a neutron. They're just going too fast. And sure enough, they knock the hydrogens clean off. Now, in a water-cooled reactor, you have a system called a recombiner that will take the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas that is always being created from the nuclear reaction and put them back together because chemically they'd much rather be water than being hydrogen and oxygen. It's a great system as long as it's operating and the, and the system is pumping. Well, at Fukushima Daiichi, the problem was is the pumping power stopped. And when the pumping power stopped, water was still getting busted apart. And hydrogen's real light, so it, even though it wants to get with oxygen again, it will dissociate fairly quickly and the hydrogen will sit at the top of the vessel and the oxygen will sit in a layer below it and then there's the water. And so this pressure was building up. The designers of that particular reactor had intentionally designed it so that you would vent the hydrogen outside of the containment building. This has always been kind of controversial. Uh, some of the early design documents said the whole point of a containment is to have the stuff inside the containment. And you're intentionally ducting the hydrogen outside of the containment to prevent an explosion. And they're like, well, yeah, but we don't want to fail the containment by having a hydrogen explosion. Okay, well, here's what happened to Fukushima Daiichi. They ducted the hydrogen up to the upper decks of the reactor, which were outside of the containment. There's just kind of a, a sparse steel frame structure up there. And one, two, three, we saw it happen on the news. The first one filled with hydrogen, got to a certain point, boom. All the panels blew up. I mean, the, the, the news, oh, we had a nuclear explosion. I'm like, no, we didn't. It wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was a hydrogen gas explosion. And it didn't burst the containment. It just blew off the, I mean, I don't want to diminish it too much, but it was not nearly as scary as it sounded. And it happened one, two, three, which tells you this isn't some accident. It's just what happens when boiling water reactor, that configuration was designed to always have emergency circulation. Uh, in fact, when we were over at my last talk, uh, some of us speculated that the safest thing to have done might have been to continue operating the reactor after the earthquake because the reactor survived the earthquake. And if it had continued operating, it would have been able to generate its own emergency power. And if it had done that, it would have continued the circulation, which would have removed the heat, which would have prevented all these other things from happening. Very ironically, maybe what we should have done is kept the thing running instead of letting it turn off. OK, let me talk about nuclear fuel, today's nuclear fuel, because that is common to both boiling water reactors, pressurized water reactors, and can -dos. This is a handful of these uranium oxide fuel pellets. You can see the picture, the guy's got gloves on. And it's easy to think, oh, he's got gloves on. 
to protect him from the uranium oxide. But now that I've taught you about the true nature of radioactivity, you might go, ah, Kirk, I'm not so sure that stuff's so, so dangerous after all. And you would be correct. He's not protecting himself from the uranium. He's protecting the uranium from himself. That stuff has to stay super pure and super clean, and you don't want to get any of your oils or grease or sweat on nuclear fuel that's going to go inside a fuel rod. So that's what the gloves are for. So they take these fuel pellets and they slide them down these zirconium tubes and they actually will, will segregate the pellets along the length of the fuel assembly according to enrichment. They'll put the most enriched ones in the middle and then they'll kind of decrease the enrichment along the length of the fuel assemblies. If this all sounds expensive to you, it's because it is. It's really, really expensive to fabricate solid fuel. And because it's so expensive, uh, the companies that make the solid fuel for the reactor they do quite well on it. In fact, back in the day, their business model for how to make a nuclear reactor was uh, sometimes referred to as a razor blades business model. In other words, where you sell the razor at cost, but then you make all your money selling the blades. So they would sell these reactors to utilities pretty much at cost in order to lock them in to a long-term fuel supply contract. It was good money for them because once somebody's bought your reactor, they're going to buy your Westinghouse 17 by 17 array fuel. They're not going to go, hey, gee, what kind of deal can you give me on this? Like, dude, you don't have my reactor, so you're working with that guy. You know, I mean, there's no market out there once you build the reactor. You're using his fuel. If he decides to change the price on you, well, that's tough. Here's the reactor. It's got its lid off, and then they'll fill the whole thing up to a level with water. So they make the whole thing into like a swimming pool. See, they can actually fill this whole thing up with water when they take the lid off in order to move the fuel back and forth because the water is radiation shielding. So you can see way down in there, they're loading the fuel assemblies in and they take the fuel assemblies out and they put it in the spent fuel pool. This is what they have to do about every 18 months to the reactor. They'll take out about a third of the fuel and then they'll load in about a third new fresh fuel and then they'll reshuffle the fuel that's already been in there. They'll move it kind of from the center out to the periphery. It's kind of like if you're when you're Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or whatever and you went camping and you built a fire. It burns the hottest in the middle and then the stuff on the edge isn't getting burned very good. Well, after a while somebody picks a stick and and pushes the, the, the wood that's been on the edge, it didn't get burned so good, into the middle and puts some new wood in and that kind of thing. The same principle. It's just a really inefficient way to burn stuff because you can't let the fuel get very damaged before you have to take it out. You can't even come, you can't even come close to 100% burn. I mean, not even approaching it because you can't let this fuel fall apart enough. If it gets too damaged, it's gonna breach the cladding, it's gonna let some of its fission products out. So you get very, very, very poor fuel utilization. Each of these square assemblies in here, and this might be a pattern to show how they go into the reactor vessel. There's a whole bunch of them. Now this uranium fuel is not very thermally conductive. It's a ceramic. It's a lot like the stuff your coffee cups or your cooking ware is made out of. Great at going to high temperature, but not thermally conductive. And so it gets very hot along the center line of the fuel. I mean, this stuff has about the cross section of a pencil, but between the center and the edge, will be like a thousand degrees of temperature difference. That puts enormous thermal stress on the material itself. So here's the basic idea of a thermal reactor. Inside the fuel rod, a fission happens and the neutron leaves the rod and it bounces around in the water and it slows down. And then after it's been slowed down to a slow down thermal neutron, it goes back into the reactor and it causes a fission. Now why slow it down? That's the difference when you're going from that little bitty dot to the big dot. Remember the big dot on the chart? That's why you want to slow it down. You want the big dot, not the little bitty dot. In a lifter, same idea, except we use graphite as the moderator instead of water. So it goes in the graphite, slows down, and it comes back in the fuel and causes a fission reaction. So after we've made the steam in the reactor, this is the steam turbine. And when I was at Watts Bar, this is the part I got to go see. This is actually the Diablo Canyon reactor in California. But I can tell you the steam turbine at Watts Bar looked exactly the same, except it was painted this really lime green color instead of this kind of funky orange and white stuff. Now, I've heard it said that a nuclear power plant is so clean you could eat off the floors. And I discovered this to be a true statement. I went to Watts Bar and I'm walking around on this floor and I looked down and I literally thought I could sit down on this floor and I could eat my dinner off this floor. I mean, it was like un unbelievably clean. The entire plant was unbelievably clean. There was not a skitch of dust on anything. Now if any of you have ever been to a coal plant and seen the same steam turbine, because they use the same technology to coal plant, it's nothing like this. A coal plant is dirty, 
it's smelly, it's filthy, and it's dripping. This thing was almost antiseptic in the way it looked. I mean, it was unreal. Is there a need for that? I don't know. I mean, they just, I just can't even convey to you how clean. It may have been the cleanest building I've ever been in in my life. This was our tour guide's favorite part right here. This is the generator. He said, this is the whole reason we're here. This is the money maker. Everything about this plant is meant to spin this guy because this guy spins and he makes enough juice, in the case of Watts Bar, to run the city of Knoxville. So I'm standing next to this machine. Uh, you can't really see a person. I mean, everybody gay high here, right here. I'm standing next to the machine, I'm thinking, this machine is about the size of my garage, and it is literally powering an entire city. I thought, wow, that is so amazingly cool. And it ran day and night, 24 seven. It ran if the sun was up, it ran if the sun was down. This is this low pressure turbine, and this is turning the shaft that's running this. Now in front of this guy is this little thing called the high pressure turbine, and you can't really see it. You see the big three low pressure turbines, but you don't see the high pressure turbine. The high pressure turbine is little bitty. It's like maybe like a third the size of the generator. But here was the cool part. Our tour guide goes, the high pressure turbine is making about two thirds of the torque that's turning the shaft. And the low pressure turbines are making about one third of the torque that's turning the shaft. I said, let me get this straight. This little guy is doing almost all the work and these big, big, big guys are hardly doing anything. And all of a sudden my thermodynamics training kicked in and I realized why. It's because when the steam goes into the high pressure turbine, it's dense. It's, it's got a lot of energy and a little volume. But then you let it blow down as it goes across the high pressure turbine and it becomes low pressure steam. Now all of a sudden, it's substantially below one atmosphere in pressure, and then you blow it over these big old turbine blades and it goes down even lower. By the time the steam comes out of the low pressure turbine, it's only at about like less than 5% of atmospheric pressure. In fact, it's so low, it's considered a pretty good vacuum. That's why these machines have to be so darn big, is because the steam that's hitting them has already lost the vast majority of the energy that it's gonna give up. So part of you thinks, well, well heck then, why do we even bother with the low pressure turbines. They're so big and they don't do nearly as much. Well, still a third of the power. You know, that's still a lot of power. You don't want to throw that part away. I just wanted to give you an idea of the disparity between that two, but the money maker, so cool. Run a whole city off that one machine. Did they ever open that thing? The generator? Yeah, generator. Did they ever have to open that? Yeah, sometimes they do. They got to check, they got to check the bearing, make sure there's no bearing damage, that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's probably not all the time, but you can do it. I mean, almost everything in here is designed to be taken apart in some way. You can see the cranes overhead. Cranes move back and forth. They can disconnect pipes. In a pressurized water reactor, the steam that's running through here has never been in the reactor. Okay, so there's no radioactivity in it, so you can deal with it. In a broiling water reactor, it's the same steam that's going through the reactor. So normally in a boiling water reactor, you don't get to get up close and personal with this power conversion while it's running. You have to turn off the reactor, you wait a few hours, and then you can go in there and you can mess around with it. But uh, not with a pressurized water reactor. You can go see it right away. There was an article not too long ago that said, could thorium power our world? Thorium is already powering our world. Thorium has been powering our world for billions of years, and thorium will power our world for billions of years. And let me tell you what I'm talking about. Inside the Earth, thorium and uranium are decaying, and they're decaying very slowly, but there's a lot of them, and the Earth is big. They produce most of the heat that drives the internal processes of the Earth. They produce the heat that drives plate tectonics, they produce the heat that drives the generation of the magnetic field. If we didn't have the energy from thorium, we wouldn't have carbon recycling in the crust. Actually, ironically, all of our CO2 would have gone away a long time ago, and that's actually a really bad thing in geologic time. Life will kill itself off without plate tectonics, because life will pull carbon from the atmosphere. It'll end up as calcium carbonate at the bottom of the ocean, and you'll run out of carbon, and the planet dies. But the good news is, the plates go like this. You form volcanoes, the volcanoes spew CO2 in the atmosphere, life continues. So it's this really cool interplay we have of geology and biology that makes it possible to have life on this planet. So, you know, yay. Yay volcanoes. Yay CO2. You know, CO2, good thing. I mean, you know, you know to, to everything in, in, in moderation. Okay. <laughs> but bigger deal, the magnetic field. The magnetic field is really important because the magnetic field is deflecting the solar wind. If you don't have a magnetic field deflecting the solar wind, over billions of years your planet ends up like Mars because the solar wind will strip off a planet's atmosphere without the protecting nature of the magnetic field. 
So if we didn't have the energy from thorium inside the Earth, we would be on a dead planet. And we wouldn't be here to have pleasant conversations like this. And not just us, but everything else too. This place would look like Mars. Okay, so good stuff, you know. Is thorium green energy? Hot dang yeah, it's the greenest energy, because it wouldn't be green without thorium in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Fun thing I tell people, I say, okay, uh, what's green energy? And they go, geothermal's green energy. Okay, do you know where geothermal comes from? No, it comes from the decay of thorium inside the earth. Is geothermal renewable? Yes. Okay, then thorium's renewable. No, it's not, you're using it up. Well, you're using up thorium as it decays inside the earth too. So any argument for geothermal, if it is rigorously pursued, is an argument for the renewability of thorium as an energy resource. And, and I love to have that debate, but I usually, they usually change the rules on me as, as I get into it. <laughs> but good one to play on your friends if they start giving you a hard time for coming to a protospace and talking about thorium. You can say, hey, dude, it's green energy. It's renewable. What? Yeah. Some people want to build a whole nuclear reactor using liquid sodium. That doesn't really light my candle. Well, maybe it would light my candle. A lot of other people do. <laughs> I don't think that's such a red hot idea because liquid sodium, unlike salts, will react with everything. Because liquid sodium is just dying to have a chemical reaction with something. And the fast breeder guys wanted to use sodium because it's a really good coolant. Uh, it doesn't slow down the neutrons, but it's very reactive. It's still a point of uh, debate. A lot of people say, hey, listen, we can make plutonium work if we use fast breeders based on sodium. Uranium-233, I mentioned, has a 160,000-year half-life, so it's not decaying very quickly, but it is decaying. And every year, if you had a ton of uranium-233, about four grams of it would decay to this thorium-229. Now, this thorium-229, it's not at all like the thorium we're going to use to make power in the reactor. This thorium has actually nothing to do with that. This is what uranium-233 will decay into. Thorium-229 will also decay. Uh, it has about a 7,300-year half-life. So it's decaying very slowly, but it is decaying. And here's one of the things it decays into on the way down, bismuth-213. Bismuth-213 is one decay away from being bismuth-209, and bismuth-209 is, is stable. Well, it's actually pretty close to stable. It's a little bit radioactive. Pepto-bismol, if you've ever chugged Pepto-bismol, all the bismuth in the world is bismuth-209. So if you're chugging Pepto-bismol, you're chugging stuff that used to be nuclear material, you know, <laughs> way back. So think about I mean, I love Pepto-bismol. It's great stuff, but... Oh, it's stuff on my nightstand. Yeah, yeah. When you go home tonight, be like, hmm, this used to be uranium-233. <laughs> All right, feeling the power, baby. Oh, it gets even worse. Bismuth 209 actually is radioactive. It's got like a 14 trillion year half-life. <laughs> I mean, it really, really, really has a long half-life, but they actually figured out it is radioactive. So go freak out your friends, go, did you know bismuth is radioactive? And they'll be like, oh, I'm never buying Pepto-Bismol again. And be like, yeah, it's a terrible idea. Just suffer. Is anything, <laughs> is anything truly not radioactive? Well, they wondered if the proton itself would decay. And we've done experiments. They, they had a hypothesis that the proton had a half-life of 10 to the 31 years. And they did these big experiments, I think here in Canada, back in the 80s and 90s. And they figured out statistically, we've got this big tank of water, and if we look long enough, even if it's you know, 10 to the 31 years, there should be like one or two or three distinguishable events. And they looked 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 and nothing ever happened. And then they began to go, you know what? I think it's stable. Or at least it's stable on a half-life more than 10 to the 31 years. I think they figured out we're at 10 to the 32 or something like that. So if all matter is radioactive, we haven't figured it out yet. So there may be hope that, you know, that matter itself isn't actually radioactive. Some stuff they've looked at, like they figured out every, every isotope of tungsten, uh, from first principles they calculated they'd all be radioactive. And they're like, nah, tungsten's not radioactive. And they go, well, have you looked really closely? And then they started looking at it and they're like, Wow, hot dang, look at that. It really is radioactive. Just has a massively long half-life. But when they went looking for it, they found out, yeah, every isotope of tungsten is radioactive. Okay, well, bismuth-213, if you could get it, and the big if is getting it, could be connected to an antibody. And here's what's really cool. These antibodies can be tailored to go and hunt down specific cells, in this case, cancer cells. Okay, now that bismuth only has a half-life of 45 minutes, so it's very radioactive and it's going away quickly. But in that time, that antibody can go and find a cancer cell and it's got this bismuth dude connected to him. The bismuth decays, an alpha particle goes through the cell and it kills the cancer cell. This is an ultra smart bomb for cancer, all right? It will target with extreme prejudice a cancer cell, because we can build these antibodies to go and find just what we're looking for. Now, here's the problem. 
Bismuth 213 is unique in this capability. And Bismuth 213 can only be generated from the decay of uranium 233. So you're thinking, well, don't we have some uranium 233 out there somewhere? We do. We have a thousand kilograms of it. This is a billion Oak Ridge where we got a thousand kilograms of uranium 233. Here's the best part. It's been sitting for 40 years. Every year it generates four more grams of that thorium 229. So they had the idea about 10 years ago. They said, oh, we want to throw this stupid uranium 233 away. But before we do, we want to pull out the thorium 229, give it to the medical community, fight cancer, save lives. And then after a few years, they said, ah, that's too much money. Let's just throw it away. So they're going to spend like $500 million to throw this stuff away and the thorium 229. So that's what makes it really unique is the fact that it's been aging like a fine wine for 40 years. There's probably about 120 grams of thorium 229 in there. That would be enough stuff to save tens of thousands of lives, maybe even more every year for certain kind of cancers. The radiation techniques we use in cancer therapy today, they're all based on beta emitting isotopes, not on alpha emitting isotopes. They have a big kill radius. They're not very directable. We, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's really not a smart bomb. Alpha emitting isotopes are really rare. It's hard to get them. It's hard to get the right kind, the right chemical one that will lock onto the right thing that's close enough to being stable that even after it decays, it doesn't just decay 10 more times in the body. Bismuth 213 is one decay away from being done. And that's what you want. You want one that's just about, to, that's on its very last decay. So guys, gals, this is a big deal. This is a really, really big deal. And it's especially good against dispersed cancers like leukemia, cancer of the blood, not tumorous cancers where there's a big hard lump that you can go in and cut out with surgery, but stuff that's really dispersed, stuff that's hard to get to, pancreatic cancer. You get pancreatic cancer, you're probably looking at a death sentence. You know, that's how bad it is. If we could go and make this happen, and we should make it happen, I mean, this would be enough reason to go and save that uranium-233 if there was no other reason to do it. It would be worth doing it just for this. But that uranium-233 can then in turn be used to catalyze energy production from a lifter. That uranium-233 would catalyze about a billion dollars of electrical generation every year from a lifter. A thousand kilograms of U-233, which is roughly what we've got, you know, 90% of that'll fission. We can make about five, six hundred million dollars in the electricity. Another 50 or 60 million dollars on the fission of the uranium-235. Almost all of it will ultimately end up fissioning out of about a thousand kilograms. About 15 kilograms of plutonium-238 will be left over. Now this is good stuff. NASA is desperate for this stuff. This is, plutonium-238 is different than plutonium-239, the stuff we use in bombs. In fact, it's worthless for bombs, but it's perfect. This is the stuff NASA uses in its deep space batteries. Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, New Horizons, all these deep space probes. They have to have a short version. We're completely out of the stuff. We stopped making it years ago. The Russians stopped making it years ago. We are out. If we don't get some, we're done exploring the outer solar system. This machine would actually make it in course of normal operation. In addition, it would make medical molybdenum-99. This is used in hundreds of thousands of uh, radio imaging procedures every year. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It would make five grams of that thorium-229 we could use in targeted alpha therapy. We don't even know how much that's worth because we haven't even really begun to explore it yet. 20 kilograms of radiostronium that we could use in radioisotope heating sources. Uh, this is the cheap stuff. It'll make xenon and neodymium. You know, not a lot of money there, 180K, 150K. But it just goes to show almost everything that comes out of this reactor can be sold. In addition, it'll make enough uranium-233 to replace itself from 1,000 kilograms of thorium. Now, 1,000 kilograms of thorium doesn't cost very much. Probably costs, I don't know, 150K. So you'd make enough selling xenon gas to pay for your thorium. Probably a couple of times over. So, I mean, you're looking at like a billion dollars Okay, I'll tell you guys this because like statistically like, I don't know, 15% of you are going to start a company that's going to be worth a billion dollars five years from now, okay? When you do that, please remember me, okay? <laughs> Come to me with your billion dollars and we're going to go make a lot more money than that, all right? <laughs> but I mean, seriously, there's, there's an amazing world out there that can be realized. Now, uh, earlier today I was in the bathroom and I was going to the bathroom and uh, I was looking on the door and there was a sign that said, here's what this place is about. It talked about what hacking was about. It was about... I don't know if I quite read it right, but it was talking about, it was about putting things together in new and cool ways and tinkering with it. And I thought, man, that's exactly what I'm talking about here. If there's such a thing as nuclear hacking, it's what this whole thing is about. Because we're not talking about nuclear technology the way it's done now. We're talking about a completely different approach 
to nuclear energy than everything we're doing now and all kinds of improvements. I mean, where did our world of personal computers and all this stuff come from? Did it come from the IBM mainframes? No, it came from dudes having homebrew computer clubs in 1975 in Silicon Valley, probably meeting in basements like this. You know, dudes like uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Bill Gates and they're you know, writing code on machines that have 8K of memory. And they're talking about things like, I think we'd have a word processor. What would that do? Well, people could like write letters on it. I mean, like a typewriter? Why don't they just buy a typewriter? Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Because back then, nobody thought about how do you use computers for dumb stuff like a game or a word processor or, heaven forbid, for graphics. You know, computers were big mainframes that, you know, kept the entire company's statistical database of, you know, sales and returns or whatever. I mean, it's stuff like this. So maybe we'll look back in the future and it's meetings and gatherings like this and we'll go, man, that was where I got started. I didn't get started at Westinghouse or Atomic Energy of Canada, or GE, none of those guys are going to go build these machines because they're already locked into the solid uranium fuel stuff. They're locked into doing it the way we do it now. And you know what? The way we do it now, I mean, we're not building reactors in any large sense. In the United States, we're building two reactors right now. We're going to shut down more reactors than that in a few years. We're not getting ahead of anything. We're, it, we'll be lucky to hold the line. I don't even think we're going to be able to do that. What about in developing countries like China and India? China's ripping it up. China's building like 50 reactors right now. But even China's realized we can't build reactors based around water cooling and, and uranium oxide fuel. It's not going to last that long. China's doing lifter, even as we speak. I found that out a few months ago. And I told people on my blog about it, and other people picked up the thread. It's, it's, it's really going on. And, and you know, I, I mean, I hope they succeed. They need it. They need the power. Uh, they, they, need to, uh, they need to be able to uh, realize the promise of Thorium. But I'd also like to see us succeed, you know? I mean, we were working on this stuff a long time ago. We made great progress on it. We set it down in 1974 for kind of dumb reasons. And I think it's high time that we, uh, we pick that thread back up again. Now, you guys, I don't think it's going to be the Department of Energy in the United States. I don't think it's going to be the Canadian equivalent of that. I think it's going to have to come from very non-traditional sources, you know? Talking to people in Silicon Valley, we're talking to people elsewhere, trying to make this happen. You guys probably all have networks of connections, and they have networks of connections. You know, let's spread the word. Let's get, let's hack on it. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a place where we could actually go and do some of these experiments? There's a ton we can do in this reactor that wouldn't even involve the radioactive materials. All the stuff with the power conversion system, all the chemistry, that could all be done non-nuclear. We could go and hack these things out and get them to work. I used to work for this guy in the Army. Uh, he was the chief scientist of uh, this army command. I mean, I was a civilian there. I wasn't in the army. One time he told me, he said, we have these whole branches of the army that all they do is they think about what we're supposed to do and they try to put together doctrine and planning and blah, blah. He goes, none of that stuff ever works. He goes, there's exactly one and only one way things really happen in the real world. He goes, some young pup like you decide, just gets an absolute burr under his saddle to go do it. And he goes off and he does it. That's how things really happen in the real world. I thought, okay, cool. I'll be that guy, and I, but I need help. I need a whole bunch of other people. You know, I, I had this dream that we would have this whole open source effort to do this, and, and that's why I started my forum and everything, thinking, oh man, we're gonna get a thousand people on there. I'll be hacking how to build the reactor. Didn't quite work out like that, you know. But I don't know. What's like, for example, one thing that you were hoping other people could tackle but didn't didn't get tackled? Like, what's the thing you're trying to do? One of the things I think that we could do is just get a hot salt loop running. You know, we could mix together some of these salt combinations. They don't have to include any of the radioactive materials. It could just be like lithium fluoride beryllium fluoride, magnesium fluoride, you can even use different stuff. Get that hot salt loop running and just get practicing on building uh, the pumps and the heat exchangers and all those kind of things. I mean, that's, that's really the, the tricks to building these machines is learning how to do a lot of the chemical and the mechanical engineering, getting it to run. The nuclear part comes later, and I don't want to say it's easy, but it's not it's probably not even a third of the challenge of building the plant is the nuclear engineering. It is mostly <coughs> a mechanical engineering and heat transfer process. And a lot of us are good at that. Yes, sir. All I've been hearing is good, good, good. Now, what's the bad? Like, uh, what, what's the biggest obstacle that we don't know that, like back then, we didn't know that xenon was actually going to be produced. What's the big maybe right now that could stop all of this? The good news is those two reactors that ran eliminated a lot of the two, the big maybes. They've established the basic physics of it. What the biggest problem is now is the technical development. We 
had a corpus of people in Oak Ridge who knew how to do this in the mid-1970s. They're literally dead and gone now. You know, I've met a handful of them. They're in their 80s. Uh, you know, they're not going to do this anymore. You know, they're, they're biding their time. Did they document their work? Oh, yeah, and that's one of the things I recovered on my website was, was the PDFs of their work spanning from about 1952 to 1976. It's all on there. It's all PDF. Amazing amount of information on there. We chew on it all the time in our online forum and, and discuss it. But the first and hardest thing I think we need to do is to get this knowledge in the nuclear community. I've been in a nuclear engineering program for years now, and you don't get taught this stuff in nuclear engineering school. You know, I, I said one time in an online talk, you could get a PhD in nuclear engineering and never learn about this stuff. And I haven't got a PhD yet, so I haven't been able to actually say this, but I got an email a few weeks ago from this guy. It was really funny. And he said, Kirk, I just saw your talk. I want you to know I just graduated from Purdue with my PhD in nuclear engineering. And I want to tell you, you're absolutely right. I have never heard of this stuff before. And he goes, I want to tell you, it's even worse than that because he goes, I'm totally a student of nuclear history. He goes, I'm so geeked out on nuclear history. I've been to all these sites. I've studied all these things, you know. And I've never heard of this. How did I not hear this? He goes, it's great, though. He goes, you're absolutely right. This is top-notch stuff they did, and we should be working on it right now. But it's absolutely possible for you to go through a normal curriculum and never learn about this. So we've, we've got to be able to, I think we need to create an online curriculum. It's one of the things I've wanted to do for the longest time. My time is limited, and I know everybody's time is limited, but we learned that in almost like a Wikipedia, well, we started a wiki and it didn't really go anywhere. Maybe we should try it again, you know, of, of you know, I would love to have a system where somebody could go, I don't know anything about this, but I know if I start on, you know, step one and go through the system, by the time I get done, at whatever pace I do it, I will be able to understand this technology. I think that's the future of our learning anyway, you know, is to have online learning where people who already have jobs and are busy doing other things are able to kind of learn asynchronously. They can learn when they got five minutes here or ten minutes there. We gotta learn how to take it in, put the big picture together. You know, get away from specializing so much. Oh, I'm an expert chemist. I'm an expert mechanical engineer. I'm an expert electrical engineer. Go on. I'm seeing the big picture. Here's how to put this machine together. Uh, you're using a eutetic mix of lithium and beryllium. Yeah, fluoride. lithium beryllium fluoride. Um, so beryllium can suck up a neutron or a, a beta, do a beta capture and spit out a neutron. Does that? Do you have to take that into account with the fuel mix? Beryllium has a has a fast neutron reaction. It's an N2N to -N reaction, but you got to hit it with a really fast neutron. And it turns out it's not really a very strong effect in this reactor. So it is a, a neutron multiplier, but that's particularly important in a fission in a fusion reactor, because fusion reactors have about 14 MeV neutrons. Fission neutrons tend to be somewhere between 2 and 6 MeV. So they generally, even at birth, don't have the energy to trigger appreciable amounts of the N2N reaction in beryllium. Okay, the uh, second boring technical question I had was um, one of the, er, kind of in, in the vein of what's what's the, the biggest problem with Lifter would be, you, you said graphite was the moderator. Uh -huh. um, the biggest problem I, I can think of is graphite flammable. And you know, that has been a problem. The guy just sent me three YouTube videos saying we went and got some reactor grade graphite put it under auction with a blowtorch and we couldn't light it on fire. So there is question about how do you get graphite to ignite? Moisture and other contaminants seem to be a big deal. Is graphite going to ignite in this reactor? I don't think so. It's something that can be worked around. It, it is really tough to get graphite to burn. It's not an easy thing to do. And I don't think it's going to be something that we're going to uh, encounter in this. I, I'll see if I can send you that email that I got. I haven't even looked at the videos yet. but. But these guys were taking on exactly that question. Now, in Chernobyl, the graphite did burn, but there was a lot of steam there, too. And they're hypothesizing the steam could have a lot to do with catal. It seems weird that steam would catalyze a burn, but you get things hot enough, and it's an oxygen source. It'll dissociate and, and uh, catalyze things. But graphite is a challenge. Uh, we have Graphite's a covalently bonded substance. I was talking about covalently bonded things in reactors. And graphite does sustain radiation damage. It would be awesome if we could have an ionically bonded form of carbon to be our moderator, but we haven't figured out how to do that. Carbon's just so darn good at covalent bonds. That's, that's a real challenge. So one of the challenges is to figure out, okay, how are we going to deal with graphite over the lifetime of the reactor? If at the end, we're going to pull it out. We need to be able to separate the graphite from any of the fission products, radioactive materials that have adhered to the surface of the graphite. So that would reduce the volume of the waste stream immensely if you could uh, separate them. One of that may be figuring out how 
to burn the graphite in the right environment so as to form CO2, which would then separate the carbon dioxide from the remaining uh, material. So I'm interested in, in the mechanisms in which you can figure out how to get graphite to burn because there may be a role for it at some point to, uh, as, as part of your waste cleanup situation. How do you scram a reactor like this? And uh, what would the containment uh, buildings be like? If you want to scram the reactor, traditionally scramming the reactor is meant inserting fuel rods, taking the reactor subcritical, then it begins to go down in fission power. Uh, some designs for this, you can use fuel rods. The MSRE had a few control rods, and they could scram it. Uh, but there's also a case to be made of not scramming the reactor and letting the reactor follow that strong adherence it has to stability rather than, uh, than scramming it. If you have a reactor that has that, it's called a negative temperature coefficient of reactivity. And if, you, if it's strongly negative, it means the reactor is very stably following the demand on it. Uh, there are some situations where you would where you might not want to have uh, control rods. One of the things about solid fuel reactors, you have to load it up with all the fuel it's going to need for 18 months of operation. So ironically, at the very beginning is the time when it has the most fuel. And then that fuel burns down over 18 months, and so you have enough at the very end to keep the thing going. In this reactor, because you're always refueling it, you don't have any extra fuel in the reactor. The main thing control rods are doing in solid fuel reactors is they're overriding the effect of that extra fuel in the reactor. Again, you're fighting yourself. You remember the ice condenser and the heat source? Here you've got too much fuel, too many neutrons, so you put in control rods to damp that down, and then over 18 months you're slowly pulling the control rods out, till by the end the control rods are almost completely out of the reactor, and uh, your fuel's burned down about as low as it's going to go before you remove it. So uh, there's not really a simple answer to that question. You, rods are a possibility. Uh, you can make channels in the salt where you can put rods in. That's what they did in MSRE. Or you can design it intentionally so that it doesn't have rods and, and uses that strong negative temperature coefficient for uh, inherent stability and control. I thought that the, in the presentations I've seen, I thought that the best idea for scramming was the, uh, the freeze plug. Well, the freeze plug is, is how you remove decay heat in a completely passive situation. That would also scram the reactor, but usually scramming it is a much more... Uh, right now moment sort of thing. It's to stop fission. The freeze plug is there so that if you're not removing decay heat, the freeze plug melts, the fuel drains into the drain tank, and is passively cooled. So the freeze plug is generally there to tackle another problem. But if the reactor were to overheat for some reason, uh, or the temperature were to go up to too high, then the freeze plug would again kick in, drain the salt, and the reactor would shut down. So the freeze plug is a really, really nice fail-safe mechanism uh, built around the laws of physics operates, you know, in this non-pressurized reactor. I can't get over what a big deal not being pressurized is. That's just, it fixes so many of the problems that you have to deal with with water cooling. I've never talked to anybody who is a steam fitter, but I gather that uh, the steam fitting ticket is the highest grade of <laughs> plumber that there is. Yeah, there's actually a steam fitters union hall not far away from uh, where I live, and I'm sure they were the ones that built the nuclear power plants near where I live, you know, as a... Uh, that's probably the work that, that put that union hall there in the first place. What's the problem here with the existing nuclear industry that they haven't more or less flipped through the book like you did and said, we haven't been wasting our time for 50 years, why don't we completely convert our industry? Is it just that they're so invested that you've sort of despaired of ever converting them? Or Help me think of an example of where an industry has completely changed itself like that. Can anybody think of one? I don't know. Does anyone remember 1998? EB1? No? Yeah. That just doesn't seem to be the way industries work. They either go out of business and a new thing comes along and figures it out. You know, I, I just... Okay, I'll give you an example. Is, uh, just before World War II, Winston Churchill decided coal is a stupid way to run a warship. We've got to change them all over oil. And he dictated it. And they did. Winston Churchill did? Yeah. Oh, well, he was head of state. <laughs> so what you're saying is we need to elect you president. Oh, I don't, I don't want to be president. Get somebody, get somebody a whole lot nicer than me. I'll, I'll, I'll stick my foot in my mouth too many times. But I wouldn't mind being an advisor to the president, you know, <laughs> especially if he or she would listen. I don't have a lot of faith that the current nuclear industry is going to take it on. And to be honest, what exactly do we want from them? I mean, all of their technology is based around technology that isn't what's going to go into this machine. We, we want the fact that they have the year of governments and very large banks, right? Okay. I mean, how many... We're not exactly building lots of nuclear reactors right now. I mean, all their money now is coming off fuel supply contracts. 
That's how GE and Westinghouse make money on nuclear power today. They don't build reactors, they sell fuel. Now, 30 years ago, they were building reactors, but, you know, that's not really going on right now. So their business model is overwhelmingly dominated by fuel fabrication. Come on, you say, hey, guess what? I got a reactor. It's got no fuel fabrication to it. They go, huh, I'm not interested anymore. <laughs> You've just upended their business model. Must the regulators um, only will look at what's already been done? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you go to the regulator and they say, show me your uh, nuclear steam supply system. And you say, I don't have any steam in my reactor. That's not how it works. Oh. Well, show me your emergency high-pressure core coolant injection system. My core doesn't run at high pressure. I don't have an emergency high-pressure core coolant. In fact, I don't ever need an emergency high-pressure core coolant injecting system. They go, well, I just don't think we're going to be able to get together on this one. You know what I mean? You're just, you just have a machine that's completely different than what they're used to regulating. How much regulation is there? Like, uh, if it wasn't for the Cold War, we wouldn't have nuclear power, is that right? So it was a government program to begin with. Do is there so much regulation if the government isn't heavily involved that it, it can't happen? In the States, I mean, I don't expect you to know that in Canada. I don't really know. The little platform is seen. Yeah, run a big cable. <laughs> oh, well, you know, plenty of countries are, are convinced that they need to go and, and regulate other countries' nuclear endeavors as well, you know. <laughs> You know, one of the things that doesn't earn me a lot of friends is uh, the notion that when we talk about, oh, so-and-so can enrich uranium, I go, um, no offense, but who are we to tell anybody what they can do? You know, I mean, uranium's uranium. It's not exactly like we have a monopoly on the stuff. You know, it's a big planet. Everybody's got some. So, you know, I'm, I don't think we should be uh, building nuclear weapons. In fact, I think nuclear weapons are terrible. But we've we've... One of the things I, I like to harp on on my blog and my Facebook page, which please all of you join, uh, the Energy from Thorium Facebook page, uh, you know, please, please fan it <laughs> or like it or whatever you do. So, uh, But one of the things I like to ran, rant on about that is about how fissile material is demonized. They love to talk about, we have this much uranium and that's good for this many nuclear bombs. And I want to go, okay. That's one very negative way to look at nuclear material. Do we pump your car with gas and go, I just pumped 12 gallons of gas into my car. Do you know how much napalm that would make? If I dropped that on a village, I would kill 5,000 little children. You know, I mean, you're like, no, of course not. I'm going to get my car. I'm going to drive 300 miles on it. I mean, it's all about what you do. None of this stuff is inherently good or bad. It's what you decide to do with it. Same goes for things like plutonium. Plutonium is... You know, I'm not the biggest fan of plutonium because I don't like. I'm not crazy about the plutonium fast breeder reactor, but there's nothing good or bad about plutonium. Plutonium just is. It's what you decide to do with it. Now we've made a lot of plutonium in our reactors. What are we going to do with it? We're going to drop it in a hole in the ground? Or are we going to feed it to a reactor like Lifter and make power out of it? I think that's a whole lot smarter thing to do. The other day I was debating some anti nukes and they were uh, getting on Lifter because they said, "Oh, this is going to use uranium, you know, from from nuclear weapons." And I said. Why is that a bad thing for you guys? You know, I think you guys would be all over that. You know, <laughs> okay, take nuclear weapons, take them apart, take the uranium out, burn it up, make electricity. That's a bad thing. Why? You want to leave it in the bomb? What do you want to do with it? You know what I mean? It's like, I just don't get it. So, uh, but our media is, is not built necessarily, uh, this is a rant I've had several times today. Um, our media is not built around effectively and accurately disseminating information to the public. Our media is built around... <laughs> Thank you. Our media is built around putting your eyeballs on their print or their website and keeping them there. And the best way to keep them there is to scare you to death and to tell you, <gasps> Meltdown of Fukushima Daiichi, stay tuned. Right back after this commercial. Yeah, exactly. I don't dare change the channel. It might happen right here live and I've got to see it, you know. As an engineer, we are taught that our responsibility is to accurately and effectively communicate and disseminate information both to other engineers and to the public at large. So an engineer gets on TV and they say, what's going to happen, Dr. So-and-so? And he goes, well, there's a possibility of several things that could happen. A very low probability event is that this might happen, but it's much more likely that, well, hey, let's get back to that low probability event. Now, in that low probability event, what could happen? Well, I, you know, the poor engineer is kind of in a corner. He's like, well, uh... You know, I guess it's possible that, but this is really unlikely. I mean, the wind would have to blow this way. And so, well, let's go that way. So we could head right for Tokyo, right? I, yeah, it, you know, it's not zero. Poor engineer, he's thinking we're at 10 to the minus 12 now or something like that, you know? <laughs> and they're going, okay, so the radioactive plume gets to Tokyo, and then what happens? Does Godzilla form? 
<laughs> well, you know, a double-ended DNA break, I suppose, in the right gene could actually trigger a increased growth rate of hormone, which could lead to mild gigantism, you know. Okay. Godzilla is coming tomorrow, you know, and you're just like, oh man, we're at like 10 to the minus 32 at this point, you know, the, pro the proton's gonna decay before this happens, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way our media works. And most people, they don't, you know, most people turn on and they go, I want to know what's going on. I, I had a friend of mine, uh, she and her husband are, are diplomats in China, and she wrote me, uh, breathlessly, it was an email, she wrote me as breathlessly as you can in an email, and she said, Kirk, are we going to be okay? I'm in China. Are, are we going to be all right? I said, Ann, don't worry. I mean, you know, let's get to 10 to 18. The iodine-131 would have to blow all the way around the world, and come back around to get you in China, and there wouldn't be enough of it, and it's got an eight-day half-life, so it would have decayed to nothing right about here, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, she was scared to death. And this is a smart girl. I mean, she went to an Ivy League school, and she was terrified because of what she'd seen on the news. And she was reaching out to a friend that she knew knew something about the subject, going, give me the straight dope. You know, this is what I love about blogging. I, I, some... Some people, they dog on blogs. Oh, blogs are stupid, you know. You're talking about what you ate for breakfast and what your dog did, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, blogs can be dumb, but blogs can also be cool because a lot of times blogs are written by subject matter experts. You know, there's a blog I read where the dude is like an expert in economic theory. And he can take some headline you've heard like, Fed raises basis point one quarter. And you're just like, no big deal. And he'll go, dude, here's why this is the end of the world. You know? <laughs> and you're going like, holy cow, this guy's totally right, you know? And it, the media is not going to tell me this, but he will. I mean, this is kind of stuff. So there's almost like a Darwinian process that happens in blogs. Good blogs stick around. Lousy blogs kind of generally go away, or somebody's just got nothing else to do but write their blog. So you get a, you get a network. So now I've gotten to the point where if I want to know something about a subject, I go find the blog that's talking about that. Because odds are there's a blog, and the person who's writing the blog is probably a subject matter expert in the thing. And they're not going to write a blog post maybe every day. But if something pops up related to that, they might start writing three or four times a day. Then they might go a month and not write anything. And then they might write a bunch of stuff. But they're not getting paid to do it. It's a passion. They want to have that like engineer credo. They want to disseminate information accurately uh, to the public. And that's why you got your blog. That could be your mistake. I think you need to work with this lack of accuracy in the media. Isn't it bad? <laughs> Well, I, mean, Come back I mean, point out that there's a low but non-zero possibility that exposure to a lifter could give you superpowers. <laughs> oh man, I've been standing on my feet too long. I think all the blood's run out of my head. <laughs> yes, man. Did you say China is building new products yes. with lifter tickets? So where are they getting the blueprints? Are they developing enough? Well, I mean, they've they probably got a whole bunch of stuff. The PDFs from my website. <laughs> Have you gone through your logs to see how many are coming from China? Uh -huh. It's been in the public domain for an awful long time. I just made it a little easier to get, you know. Uh, the Chinese can, can go get this document. I mean, they went to Oak Ridge, and they, uh, in fact, I had a friend who was there at the meeting, and, you know, they took him around the lab and showed him everything, and it's funny going to Oak Ridge because they're all about the info and the nano and the bio, and you want to go, what about the nuclear? They never talk about that part, you know. Well, they get to the end of the, the trip, and the Chinese official, his name was uh, Dr. Zhang Ming Hen. Interesting about Dr. Zhang Ming Hen, his father was Zhang Zemin, who used to be the premier of China. So this is not a poorly placed guy in Chinese society, you know. He's also an electrical engineer. He's a PhD in electrical engineer from Drexel University. Very, very bright guy. Uh, so they get to the end of the meeting, and I'm told by my buddy who was there that they said, you know, the Oak Ridge people said, well, you know, we had this great trip. Have you learned what you wanted to learn? And they go, we're actually here to learn about the molten salt reactor. See, we're going to build one. We've already got a site picked out, and we're going to have it built by 2020, and we're here to learn everything we can about it. <laughs> and the Oak Ridge people were like, huh. <laughs> molten salt, what's that again? <laughs> so uh, my buddy told me that, and I thought, oh, boy. Yep, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. That's good. How much did it cost to build? How much did it cost to build? Uh, I, I can take a guess, but the first standard deviation on that guess is about two-thirds of the value of the guess. Yeah. So usually when you've got a guess where the standard deviation is a more than half of the guess, the guess ain't any good. It's an order of magnitude approach. Yeah. It's good enough. What's your ballpark <laughs> figure? Like, is this Home Depot stuff? Or no. <laughs> no. I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think a first unit, uh, which is probably going to be on the order of 
you know, 20, 30 megawatts electric is, we're looking at several hundred million dollars to develop that. But then taking the step beyond that to a utility class scale reactor, probably another several hundred million dollars. I mean, you know, you're probably looking at a billion dollars to bring this up to utility class. But when you consider what it's going to do, that's really not all that much money. Now, anybody who's going to loan me money is going to... It's labor. I'm, I'm thinking resources just like physical... A lot of it is, is the engineering, you know, and then the regulation is a huge question mark. It's, all, it's actually not a lot of money, in a sense. Maybe you'll have to spend a trillion on that, debating some kind Well, we of do, and that's, that's see, the that's the thing. People go, we're going to spend a trillion dollars on pizza. And you go, okay, but buy, buy, people buy pizza, and they're going to get pizza five minutes later. You know, they know what they're buying. It's all about... I've learned it's not about the number, it's about the uncertainty on the number. You can go to a, an investment bank right now and you can say, I want to build a dr an oil drilling platform and it's going to cost $12 billion. And they will write you a check for that because you can go and say, I've built 50 of these platforms before, you know, here's about where the price came out. It's going to go in this area which is producing right now this much oil, it's going to be out here. It's going to take us this long to recover this much oil based on how we've done it the other 50 times. And then go, there's not a lot of uncertainty in doing this. If I put $12 billion into this guy, I'm going to get $40 billion over the next 20 years and it's going to be nice and steady and here's going to be all the rates. I mean, it's all about uncertainty. So you go and say, hey, invest a billion dollars in Lifter and we'll make a billion dollars back. They go, no. Nah. Nah. <laughs> I'll invest in the oil drilling platform. I mean, it's just, this is why I wonder about environments like this. You know, people just go, ah, heck, I'm just going to go do it. You know, I mean, it's like. Do you think it's possible to create a little company and <laughs> feasible, not feasible? So yes. I want to know. Create a little company. The answer to your question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, but you start by not making the full lifter, but yes. making like a little piece, and then you take some of these byproducts that you're saying are very valuable. Can you, can you yes. use that way, and you use that money to, you know, go is that in the word? Like, so that the question then becomes, what do you spend? The question then becomes, what do you spend to get that that little first stage that starts making? Are you sure we don't have the Ethernet jack plugged in the back of our heads? Because. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're doing wireless here, I don't think, you know. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? <laughs> no. So that's where you're Sorry, this question's not covered by an NDA. <laughs> uh, we got some smart people in this room. That's really good. You know in the, in the movies where like some plague has hit the earth and all the survivors are huddled in the basement somewhere and all they do is like figure out how to like stop the plague or destroy the asteroid or whatever they gotta do to save the earth. And it's like all they do, right? What would it be like if we just had like a really bunch of smart people and we were all crammed in a room for some reason because some I don't know, apocalyptic horror had happened somewhere else and all we did was work on this? How long would it take us? I was like, man, well, I bet we'd go real fast. I bet it wouldn't take us nearly as long as we think. I thought, well, that was basically the Manhattan Project. They went out and they grabbed all the smart people. They created the secret city in New Mexico called Los Alamos. They stuck them all there and they said, this is all you do. You do this. You don't get to go see your families or talk to anybody or write letters or talk on the telephone. You do this. Three years, they did it. And it was a whole lot harder than what we're proposing to do. So, okay, you know, I got a job. I got four kids. You know, I like to sleep eight hours a night. How do you figure that out? You know, well, you say, okay, maybe I have an hour. And maybe there's a hundred other people who have an hour. What can we all put together? And the hardest part is coordination, you know, because you could easily spend 45 minutes of that one hour just trying to sync up with what other people are doing. But then maybe there's some value in overlap, because a lot of times in over, there's a Darwinian selection in overlap you, you're in, uh, in um, doing the same thing. You go, oh, that guy did almost the same thing as me, except he did steps three, four, and seven. Well, maybe that's a better idea. You know, I mean, and pretty soon you're it's getting better and better and better. Ideally, we would be able, oh, and this is going to sound really corny. I want to say, what if we were like the Borg? You know? <laughs> I have this theory that someday we're all going to turn on the Borg anyway. It's not because the Borg assimilated this. It's going to be because, because we actually chose to become the Borg. You know, you see those people with their, with their Bluetooth in, and you go, oh, I can totally see it coming, man. We are, like, totally on our way to becoming the Borg. But look at the Borg. I mean, they could have, you could have a thought. Everybody could have the thought. You know, the idea could be disseminated, improved, rattled upon, blah, blah, blah. How can we, like, get the good part of the whole Borg thing without getting, like, the bad part of being mindless drones and being gray-skinned and all being bad? I bet there's like 10 aspects to this problem that I'm completely flummoxed on that if somehow I could like get the problem statement in all of your heads, 
one or two or three of you would figure it out really quickly and go, well, Kirk, have you thought about it this way? And all of a sudden I'm like, no, dude, I have totally not thought about it that way. You're right, that would work. None of us are individually smart enough to be able to figure out all pieces and parts of this. The problem is it takes an awful long time to convey to everybody what all the problems are and what piece you can take on and say, okay, here's a piece I'm pretty darn smart on. Yeah, I met a guy a few hours ago at Mont Royal who said, I'm a marketing guy. You know, he goes, well, what can I do? I said, there's a lot you could do, man. This thing needs a marketing campaign in a big way, you know. Nuclear's got some bad PR. How do you tell people, this isn't your father's nuclear, or this is different, or I mean, this like has like nothing in common with what, nuclear right now means water-cooled reactor, uranium oxide solid fuel, poor fuel efficiency, and steam turbine. That's what, that's what nuclear power means right now. So people look at Fukushima Daiichi and they go, is this the end of nuclear power? And I go, no, it's not the end of nuclear power. It's like, you know, there's a zillion other ways to do nuclear power. I think this is the best way I've been able to come up with so far. Maybe I'm wrong though, maybe there's a better way. I've been looking for it. I'm, I tell anybody, I got a standing invitation. You can figure out how to do this better. I will be happy to get off Lifter and go do whatever it is that's better. I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for it. You know, I got no, I have, my only allegiance is the best idea, not to any one idea. Would fusion be one of those ideas that you'd go to? Man, I should have put in all my charts about fusion because I used to, I used to be so into fusion, especially helium-3 fusion, mining the moon. Oh my gosh, I read so many books about that stuff. And talk, I've even talked to Harrison Schmidt, the astronaut. And I took this fusion class when I was at Georgia Tech. And I'll never forget it because I went into that class going, man, fusion's awesome. It's the answer, blah, 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 blah. And we started studying and I go, man, this is really hard. And the basic reason fusion is hard is because charged particles don't want to get near each other. Okay, bare nuclei are both charged, positive charged, they want to avoid each other. And my professor had this really great way of putting it. He said, it's like playing mini golf. There's this thing in fusion called the Lawson Criterion. There's three things that a fusion reactor has to have, density, confinement, and temperature. And he had this great analogy where he says, it's like going to the mini golf. He says, you know how the mini golf, you got the volcano, right? And the volcano's got the hole at the very top. And you've got to put your ball in a way that it goes all the way up the side of the volcano and whoop, falls in the hole. He goes, okay, that's like fusion, all right? The ball is like a nucleus and the volcano is the scattering effect. So anytime you want to have a nucleus go to another nucleus, it scatters. It rolls up the mountain and it rolls down the side or it rolls up here and rolls down. And only when you just perfectly get it on the right angle does it go in the, does it go in the volcano. Now the problem with fusion, he goes, now you can't putt your ball, you can't steer the ball, and you have to have it, you have to have enough temperature so that it can make it all the way up the side of the volcano and fall in, and then you have to have enough balls, because you can't steer them, that they're there at the mini golf park, that's density, and then because they're flying all over the place, you've got to make sure there's a fence around the mini golf park so they don't get away, that's confinement. So he says, those are your three things, density, temperature, and confinement to make fusion happen. I said, dude, that's really hard. So I came up with another analogy. I said, so I guess fission would be like the mini golf park, except now the volcano was flush with the ground. The hole is about this big around. The balls are going slow, and every time the ball goes in the hole, two more balls come out. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Here's what fusion is like. Fusion is so hard that we can build a fusion reactor, and we can have 100 PhDs working on it, and they still have no idea what's going on. He goes, fission is so easy that we can take a couple of kids out of high school, train them for a few months, and they can be running a nuclear submarine. I said, yeah, you're right. That is really hard. And this guy had spent his whole career in fusion. And I said, well, I don't think we're ever going to get there. He goes, that's okay. It's great science. We make, we make a lot of PhDs off doing fusion. And I was like, oh, man, you know. So, so my, my hope for fusion is not particularly high. You know, I... I I'd love to be wrong, but I sure ain't seen it yet. And I've looked at Focus Fusion, I've looked at that Steam Piston Fusion, and I've looked at D-Helium-3 and P-Boron and all these other kind of things, and I'm still going, I'm just not buying it yet, you know, but maybe I'm wrong. You're saying the business case isn't there. That's what you're saying. It's just so darn hard. I mean, a fusion reactor is a big vacuum tube at 10 keV, which is like 15 trillion degrees. And then inside this is, is superconducting magnets that are held in liquid helium. All of this is jacketed in a lithium blanket that will breed megacuries of tritium, you know, which will then be injected into this reactor, which is driven by these giant neutral ion beams. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, can we make this thing any more complicated than it is? And even then you can't hold 
the confinement for more than a few microseconds in the tokamak configuration, which is the most favored and, and desired. So, oh, guys, I got to sit down pretty soon. I <laughs> just about the I got. But what's your question? The, the, the people in the Italy who did a thirty to one confusion. Uh, sorry, not confusion, but c conversion fusion reactor. You feed it four hundred watts in, you get twelve thousand four hundred watts out. Uh huh. What, what about that? I haven't heard about that. Okay, that would be Nobel Prize material. That would be it was all crazy. over the YouTube. So okay. It's not, all, over the, not all over the YouTube. YouTube's all over. That's all over Nature, Science, and every physics journal out there. Well, it's, okay. yeah, it's 400 watts in, 12,400 watts out. Cool. Cool. Let's see. That's, that, yeah, those, if, that, if that works, those guys will win the Nobel. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have bad experiences with quacks like Pons and Fleischmann it's some, and all kinds of other people. At a university, like they seem pretty, like they got dark. Well, Pons and Fleischmann were at a university too. They were at University yeah, of Utah. Well, I remember yeah, that one. Yeah. I mean, I'd say this: Hey, lifter, you don't put any watts in, and you get as many watts as you want. Huh? <laughs> uh, vision's pretty dang awesome. I mean, I mean <laughs> yeah, it's very easy in comparison. All right, well, hey, thank you all so much. Had a great time. This morning. <laughs> this guy's been working hard today. I, I wonder actually um, if the sand left over from the tar sands is average composition. <laughs> it still has the 10 parts per million yeah. thorium and uh, more energy in yeah, and more energy in the ash out of a coal plant than came out of the coal. I know it's stuff like that. Uh, it's just, it's, it just boggles your mind to realize right. there's more energy in the mm -hmm. ash in the form of thorium and uranium yeah. than there is in the coal or the mm -hmm. or the tar sands. Yeah. I just, you just go, can this be real? You know, I mean, you know, ignorance is bountiful. <laughs> well, I was, I, when we were at the university, I was telling them, I'm worried if we don't do this, our kids and our grandkids are going to look back someday and they're going to go, why didn't you, if you knew about this and you knew yeah, it was possible, exactly. here we've got this world racked by resource wars, mm -hmm. political unrest, yeah. global warming. Mm -hmm. Why didn't yeah. you fix it if you knew how to do it? It wasn't like you didn't have an option. You did, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm mad enough. If I could go back to 1969, I'd go talk to those guys and say, why didn't you do this? We're 40 years behind schedule. We should have been energy independent 10 years ago on this technology. And instead, we're still starting. Do you, you think know? it could be part of it could be continuing a disparity? Uh, you know, uh, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer kind of thing, like taking, adva taking advantage of uh, the there, overall there is so much, just, There is so much energy in the form of thorium available. Like everybody should have ample amounts I mean, of power, yeah, right? Yeah. If we could go back in time 500 years and find the guy who's on the very top of the heap of society, mm. the king, all right? Yeah. And you look at his lifestyle, what's he got? He got a castle, all right? Yeah. Well, where does he go to the bathroom? What does he eat? Yeah. Yeah. When he gets sick, what does he take? Yeah. He lived worse than the, the poor people live now. Yeah. And he was the king. He was the top of the heap. Yeah. You know, so 500 years from now, where could the average person in society be? I don't know, maybe they have their own that's space right. colony. You know? <laughs> energy rich future. An energy rich future. And that's the part that just frustrates me so much about this we meme that yeah. has gotten into the environmentalist community, which is yes. energy is inherently bad no. and you should use less of it yeah. and you're more virtuous if you use le like earth hour i, I represent yeah. the environmental movement for calgary personally i think i do anyways and i don't okay. think energy is bad in the slightest oh good we, we, we want an energy rich future we just don't want a unsustainable energy exactly rich exactly Burning ancient dinosaurs and old plants that then yes. it's just concentrated solar energy you know perpetually like 200 some million years later it's yeah. just a really roundabout way to get to solar but i saw earth hour the other day and it's all about turning the lights off and i just yeah. want to go Total joke. You want the the lights? The light is symbolic of our progress over darkness. Mm -hmm. We have lights so the saber toothed tiger didn't drag you out of the cave and <laughs> eat you. You know, yeah. that's what the fire was for. You know, yeah. the guy goes, "I don't like the fire. It's dangerous and it puts out toxic byproducts." <laughs> I'm gonna go sleep on the savanna. Yeah. Well, that guy got ate by the tiger that night. Right. Didn't reproduce. You know, and the, yeah. and the guy who learned. There's this friend of mine, uh, Rod Adams. Many of you probably know him. He's a blogger. Yeah. He has this great piece called "Fission Is the New Fire," mm -hmm. and it was an awesome like nice. thought to get my head around he said yeah. okay
who knows? We don't have any records of when fire was invented. But probably when fire was invented, there were a lot of people who were like, ooh, this is dangerous, it's scary, it can hurt me. And some people were like, well, yeah, it can, but you got to be careful with it. If you learn how to use it the right way, it's a really good thing. It keeps the bad animals away, it cooks the food, it keeps you warm, you can see, that kind of stuff. And it was all about learning to manage the technology. What do we do with kids now? We teach them right from you know, fire safety children. Okay, mm -hmm. no. We, where's the future where we teach nuclear safety yeah. starting at, with six-year-olds, you know? Okay. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. So we grow, up, we grow up fearful and afraid. We get to this point in life where we should yeah. know about the basics of radioactivity or fission or anything, and we're going, oh my crap, what's on TV? Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah. it's in our milk. Ah, you know, and it's because, yeah. it's it's in us. It's it's because we, we don't know, we're not taught, and we should eat. Now, now we have the internet where we can okay. go and get taught. Quick, quick question for the group. Uh, which manufacturer of phones and things is going to put a personal dosimeter into uh. their phone? Blackberry, I, uh, iPad. Uh, I don't know. They'll yeah. probably be a Japanese company. Yeah. Well, one of the things <laughs> I've heard is, is uh, that they were selling out on Geiger counters after the Japanese thing. And I thought, you know what? This is going to be a great thing because those people will get their Geiger counter, they'll take it outside, they'll turn it on and start going, clickety, 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 clickety. Oh, it's everywhere! And they'll go, it's everywhere, Ronnie! Oh, 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 and and if, they, if they don't come on a plane and yeah. they'll see, oh, it's ten times more than when I'm on the ground. But if yeah, you stop for a minute and didn't completely there's freak not out, all this protective air. you yeah. would start to go, oh my gosh, radon. Okay, there's a radioactive gas that's seeping out of the ground all the time, and I'm breathing it, and there's nothing yeah. I can do about it. And here we and are it's, in the basement. And it's ah. overwhelming. Oh, yeah, right now, we're yeah. sucking down a lot of radon right People now. People don't have a clue what radioactive even means. They don't. They don't. They, they, they think I, it means some sort of poison. They don't know that it's light in a frequency they're not seeing. Yeah. Not all. And, and, well, and, and I did. I mean, I can't blame people. Yeah, too bad. I didn't know either. I was just. This, I was talking to a guy sits right next to me at work. A PhD from MIT. I mean, the guy is uber smart, mechanical engineer. He started talking to me about this stuff yesterday, and he was really scared to death. I mean, I mean, and I'm sitting there. You know, we can scoff, but at the same time, I'm going. This guy's no dummy. He just doesn't know about it. But I'm an idiot and I'm not afraid. Well, so well it's because you've, you've had more education on this than he has, despite his PhD from MIT. Yeah, I mean, it's just, he was like, oh, I heard there's some iodine. Oh my gosh, I don't know. Maybe I better go. Guy, guy kind of saying, Vaughn, it's no big deal. You're going to be okay. Well, people in health food stores here were buying up iodine, uh, one, uh, iodine supplement tablets. And you, you can know, actually get like yourself iodine. sick on to taking Absolutely. potassium iodine because it's, it's way more iodine than your body needs. Yeah. It's there to flood your thyroid if you really are being exposed to troubling amounts of 131. Yeah. You know, and if you take it just because, oh, I want to feel safe, not sorry, you could actually hurt your health. Yeah, well, just yeah. like you mentioned, it has a half life of eight days. Chances are it'll be half of it by the time it even gets to this continent. Oh, yeah. not chances, yeah. certainty. Exactly. I mean, you can go to the bank on these numbers. <laughs> they are, there's no doubt. Well, I read a comment on one of the, uh, on an article about iodine, it was saying, the guy was saying, the article said, oh, it's decaying every eight days. And the guy goes, well, that's no good because this reactor's just spewing it out. And I'm sitting there going, no, it's not. It's made all the iodine it's ever going to make. Once it sh The moment those, those sensors commanded the rods to go up in the reactor, the production stopped yeah. at that moment. It's got as much as it's ever going to have, and in a month it will all be gone. So when the spent fuel was, when they were talking about the spent fuel might be burning, is there going to be an iodine release? I said, no, there's absolutely no iodine whatsoever in the spent fuel. It's long gone in the spent fuel. The only place that iodine can come from is the core, because that's the only place where it is. But it's just little stuff like that that... Uh, when you said the, the guy from Mount Royal, he didn't know what, what can he do as a marketer. That, that question blew my mind, because he, he can do everything. He can, he can make a huge difference. He yeah. can make yeah. people aware. It's just well, I said, it's look, so frustrating. Dude, I started a dumb blog, and I like yeah. started a page, and like, crap. I mean, I get invited to go talk to Proto Space. You know, it's like, there's a million people can do exactly what I did. It's not that hard. familiar with the Pemben Institute? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they're they're okay. advocates for so, sort of sustainable power in general. They they speak to the top guns of nuclear and BP oil and et cetera, right? And there was a talk recently, and I was there, and I said, "Have you ever heard of uh, liquid fluoride thorium reactors?" And he's like, "No." I'm like, "You work in the energy industry, and you don't know about energy. Like, are you some sort of idiot or what?" And uh, he didn't take that too nicely, but he was he was gonna Google LFTR later on. 
which yeah. I think is the only important aspect of that. I've learned the hard way: never try to educate somebody publicly, especially in a Q and A yeah. session. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't <Introverts>. work. <laughs> yes, don't shame them publicly. Just, just, few and far between are people that will go, "Oh, I didn't know that. I stand corrected in a public scenario." Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. most people go. Just tell people to Google LFTR. They'll watch the 16-minute remix that Gordon did. And yeah, everyone yeah. Way to go, wiser. Gordon! Yeah. <laughs> I did talk to our MLA, the only Alberta Party guy, Dave Taylor, and uh, I, I, I gave him the link. Oh, okay. Well, he, basically, they can't shape policy, right? The guy, the best they can do right now is look into something. So they have policy people to look into it. But it's like at every level of government, it is kind of feasible that you can contact an MP. An yep. MLA, uh, I don't think it's feasible municipally, right? It just seems like too big ticket an item. But it's like your local representative, uh, it's kind of what they're there for is pinging about your concerns, and this is a valid concern, well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just like making them feel ignorant so that they don't, like, I want them to feel, oh, this is the new it, and you're not even, that like, you don't even well, know. And they're like, oh, I don't even know. I gotta. Let me, let me caution on that. That's. Generally not a good. I mean, it works <laughs> yeah, for people you know, like us. Like it works talent. really well it for a lot of people. Doesn't work for people who are generally public figures. You yeah. know, their response is, "Whoever that guy is, I hate his guts." And I'm going to show up. No will crush yeah. you. No yeah. such thing as yeah. bad people. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so my my whole question in my mind yeah. is: Is it going to take 20 years and all the old people have to die first? Or are we going to pull it off now? Yeah, I would much rather pull it off. Than wow. Yesterday. Yeah. Let's buy a junkyard. <laughs> junkyard you know, wars. Have a convention, a big camping trip. Get all yeah, these we, we hacker the spaces out there. Well, James, this doesn't always, have to be more build something in their garage. That's right. So let's start. It can be run on, on recycled I'm materials as much as humanly possible. This could be. This is feasibly done. The billion billion dollar number you threw out puts in mind, yes, we have to have a bunch of research and design scientists working for $90,000 a year to feed their families in whatever system it is they exist. Dude, you're talking about me. So. I'm sorry, but, but there are a lot of us who don't give a shit about money who just like to be, be paid nothing. So how, many, how, many, how many kids do you have? Zero. <laughs> okay, I have four. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I understand, I but... Right people. They're out there. Yeah, well, really get get 150,000 volunteers and this has done zero but, hours, But right? 12 years ago, uh, I was you, so... Yeah. Yeah. But you said, you said we, hacker spaces should get on building parts but we we could do that like i yeah. we can we can pump your fuel with no moving parts i yes. thought about this while we were watching Really? Absolutely. No, 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 because ionic fluids ionic no. fluids are electrically <laughs> conductive. Yes. You can run current the through them and use Lenz's law to push the fluid. Yeah. And it, they looked at it's it can be done, it's pretty tough though. Yeah. But it's not you, possible. But I think but it's tough. Do, uh, like um it, F is it, F is J cross B. Uh, so I mean we, we could we could probably build a small prototype there was on a, that pretty see, the quickly. Good thing about the, the website, for instance, you can go there and you can you can Google a paper on my page and go, electrical conductivity of molten salts. And you find the paper. And you read the paper and the summary will say, we are curious about this number because we want to run an EM pump for salt. Yeah, that's why we went and found out what the number was. If you do a coaxial design, with, uh, it would have to be some sort of ceramic insulator to puncture here. But you, you basically uh, charge the outside negatively and the inside positively. You run current um, radially uh -huh. through, the through the salt. And then you could have a solenoidal magnetic field, which is really easy to do. You just run current this way on the outside, and well, F is Q cross or F is J cross B. The the force is just into the board here. Uh -huh. So if you do this all the way around the fuel cycle, so you pump it with no moving parts. It, it'd be all electromagnetic. Yeah. The only thing is, you'd need a ceramic here to insulate the whole way along because you can't just. If, if, if this whole thing isn't insulated to the upper part here, uh -huh. um, you, you'd get a short here and you'd just get eddy currents here. But whether or not you can get a ceramic that can... I, I, don't, I know nothing about no, ceramics. No, this is a, this, see, this is a perfect thing. You could build a loop. Uh, like well, you said, you said 1,100 cat k. That's um, not completely unbeatable. You can do it a whole lot. Ceramic, ceramic, put on the circle well, the the ceramics, are, ceramics are fine. It's the, the, the radiation, I'm thinking, um, <laughs> might be an issue. It might weaken it. Um, yeah. But... I mean, that, that's replaceable parts, quite possibly. But yeah, a coaxial design would probably be the best for a pump. The, this might be a weakness here, where you're puncturing the... Uh, but you're not under pressure, so it's not really no, much of a weakness. Pressure, yeah. Does anyone here work in the oil patch? 
That was a broad thing I was really okay. hoping and, for. Okay, um, if any of you guys work in the oil patch, see if you can source us some super alloys. Hastaloys, um, I think some of the CPM crucible steels are pretty resistant uh, to, to corrosion. If we, could get, if we could get like a four foot loop uh, of Hastaloy tube, we could build a prototype You might be able to get away with Inconel. If you, if you didn't want it to survive very long. See, Inconel will work. Well, even if we use just a stainless steel and killed the thing after an hour of running yeah. it, we could do a proof of concept. If, if we could do like That was four, what Aircraft Reactor couple. Experiment was like. They built yeah. it out of stuff that knew it wasn't going to last very long because they just wanted to see if yeah. the basic idea even sound. Yeah, so yeah. We, could, we could Home Depot this. This could be a weekend project where at the end of the weekend we have a working proof of concept, Lenz's Law, uh, fluid salt pump. When are you going home? Well, I was going to go snowboarding this weekend. <laughs> not right now. I have finals. <laughs> Gord, what am I doing on uh, Saturday? We, oh, uh, that's tomorrow, right? No, that's no, day no. tomorrow. Oh, I know what I'm doing tomorrow. I think they TEDx. I don't know what I'm doing. I think TEDx is stuff lined up for you in the morning. I, I was only going to look for spare Kirk time because uh, <laughs> if I take any TEDx time, then they'll kill me. No, no, TEDx is theirs, but that's Friday. No, no, but they might have Sorry. press stuff for you on Saturday. Well, Saturday Sorry, they. they they have all the Tyvex people at the Arts Hotel, so they might have something mm -hmm. Saturday uh, morning. Can you find out what that means? Me too, me too. I gotta get it done before I go to grad school. Maybe what we should do is, yeah, well, like, there's something lost when you're communicating, I find, electronically. There's a lot of oh, value there's there, a lot. but this, like, one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. like, I don't care to watch a YouTube video half as much as to sit here and oh, listen to it. Oh, it's so much right? better. That's why it's worth doing so, these. Like we, conference calls are pretty we, good. That's true. Skype's pretty but good. Yeah. Like this kind of group of people, which exists in a lot of cities right now, yeah. care like passionately about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We could organize. Like that's there have been, there. there's a precedence. There's other events for these kinds of groups of people to go travel to and meet at. Like I don't know. Just because we might not build it in the first session, I'd be yeah. totally down with arranging like a camping trip or something. Oh. Where there we needs all to be a not-for-profit organization right. built around LFTR well, well, as there a is. concept. Thorium oh. Energy Alliance. Thorium and, Energy and Alliance? International Thorium Energy Organization. There's two of them. Well, uh, what about the hacker conferences that happen in we're nuclear having, bomb shelters? Ago, what about, what's oh. well, yeah, yeah, Tor Camp is totally an example of the same thing. Yeah. Has anyone ever tried it, physical engineering at one? Has anyone ever tried physical engineering at one where they were building something? I haven't heard of it, but I'm going to be totally natural. I haven't heard of it. It's going to be a big battery. Yeah. We're having a conference on May 12th, yeah. you know, yeah. join, participate, Where is the it's, it's going to be in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, we, we can, there's about as many people here as what are at our, we're at our first story of Energy Alliance conference. Uh -huh. We can have another one. <laughs> Let's have one in Canada. Let's have one in Canada. The, uh, I can't remember. Did you say the uh, the, the, Calgary. the yeah. thorium is like a, a thorium salt, like thorium fluoride? Does in it split reactor? as an ion as well? Or does it stay atomic in the reactor? Well, in the reactor, it's 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 more associative with those four fluorine okay. ions. But it doesn't ionize, does it? Because if it ionizes, this is a my my idea is stupid. Well, uh, because I'll you'll end up getting a concentration gradient across here, and that will change oh. your your den your fuel density. So you'll get way too hot at the core here, and uh, way right. too cold at the You're inside. You're essentially here. electrolyzing yourself. Yeah. Could but you we use could that do temperature some... differential to drive it? Well, you could compensate for it. You could comp. This is what you do is you're 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 electrolyzing. You're making like metallic lithium. Yeah, and yeah. Gas you're basically it, it's yeah, like you're, no, you're yeah. You're electroplating it's, it's the center exactly. here with your metals and building a gas bubble on the outside here. But it like <laughs> but it sounds like aluminum manufacturer. Well, that's how yeah. That is made. how aluminum is made. Aluminum is based yeah. on fluoride yeah. salt technology. Yeah. But but we could do AC. If we did AC oh. and swap the current on the magnetic field, swapping the field here, we wouldn't get this uh, ion differential here. If we, if we, but if it's AC, okay. we'll move. F no, it would. It Dude, would I gotta work. tell you, I gotta work. tell you about this. I had the same idea at NASA, but I was trying to think of an ion engine based on molten salts. Oh, yeah. And, and I came up with an AC ion engine, which was a big deal because all of our ion engines were based DC. on DC. Yeah. And AC is a lot easier to generate on a spacecraft yeah. with, a, with a dynamic power conversion system. So all my yeah. my friends who were ion engine experts told me I was crazy, and then I went to MIT. This is like five years ago. And I was telling them about my ideas, and the guy goes, oh, yeah, you want to come see it? And we go down to his lab, and sure enough, <laughs> yeah. he's got it. It looked like a big razor, 
and it was it was based on a molten salt, and it was based on AC current. I was like, it works. Yeah, I finally <laughs> invented something that actually works. And he's like, well, you didn't really invent it. AC you would fix. You just that. figured it out after I did. <laughs> I yeah. like, All right. AC well, would fix the concentration <laughs> problem because yeah. if you if you change the phase of the electric field in here in phase with the magnetic field switching from clock or counterclockwise to clockwise back and forth, you'd get the same direction of force, but your ions would just go and oscillate in here and they wouldn't have any net motion. If you're worried about I don't know. Let's build one and see what happens. I don't understand a lot <laughs> yeah, of. Yeah, I will build one. Make it out of some stainless steel. I don't understand a lot of the physics going on here, but you're talking about electroplating. If you want to make a cheap salt, use uh, use NaF, use sodium fluoride. What if you, yeah, it's a yeah. lot cheaper than lithium fluoride? What if you like nest these? Sodium fluoride. Like, does that make any sense? If you nest these, you Sorry? have. You have a magnetic field within a magnetic field, and you arrange them. The more magnetic fields you get that go beyond simple solenoids or straight lines, the more complexity you get because magnetic field lines are always closed, so you get weird eddies between the two and stuff. Okay. Um, this is really dirt simple. I, yeah. I think yeah. that just beautiful. Yeah. I think that this is the way to go. I think that this is the way to go. So, so I, I think I think I have to shut this down. Just, uh, I mean, I would keep taping and all that stuff. But uh, Kirk, oh, sorry, Kirk actually needs to work on a TEDx PowerPoint presentation, which will save his life yeah. if he beats Jasmine in person tomorrow. So, yeah. Jasmine, we, Jasmine will already kill me. Yeah. So, I mean, we got to get you she back to the hotel all on all the your... fingers off. <laughs> just the tips. So we just got to get you back at your hotel on the computer. Do they have a Wi-Fi at the hotel? They yeah. have to. They have to. They have they, to. If they, they don't, go there like, yeah. that'll be $15. If, if, they, <laughs> if they don't, we'll make something work. If they don't at this point, I'll just cell phone. You'll have it cell phone. I'll yeah. sell out the obscene price for the Wi-Fi at this point. Yeah. So are you saying the Thorium Consortium or whatever? I forgot what you called it. Thorium Energy Alliance? Yeah. Yeah. You said that they had a conference? The tea party. They, I love we that. Had, we had, hey, we were tea before tea party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, were actually, we were actually tea back in like 2008. The new Freaking tea. eraser. It just, it just happened to become tea party. Yeah. I, I said, John, I was like, you yeah, guys like my this tea party that. thing and we're tea. And maybe people would think we're all like uber conservative, you know. <laughs> and, uh, even though we do have a lot of really conservative people, we also have a lot of really liberal people. One of the things that's really interesting about this is not, you know. No, it is not. Uh, the, it, yeah. They come from all, I mean, like, there's one guy came to the conference, he goes, apolitical. He goes I'm, I'm fully Marxist, and I'm totally behind yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like I was like, like I am like, right-wing, yes. hardcore libertarian, and I'm behind this, you know, and everybody gets along, because it's like, uh -oh. it's political.